Hey, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, Grant. Just give me a second there, Keith. Warren Gordon, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, Keith. That's great. You can hear me as well. Good. Yeah. Hi. Hi, you, Gordon. You're very welcome to your first, your first of many health meetings. Okay. Um, so everything ready to start then, Clark, is it? Yes, that's us. That's us going now, Chair. Okay. Just give me a second here. Okay, and we are, we're on air at present, is that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay, okay members, um, good morning. Uh, we have, a, uh, I now declare the meeting open to the public online, and I'd like to welcome all of the members who are participating by video conferencing today to maintain the social distancing. Um, I'd also like to remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Um, so no apologies have been received, members, and I think we have full attendance. Uh, just checking, is there any apologies from members? No. Thank you. Okay, members, first of all, in terms of chairperson business, I would like to welcome our new deputy chair, Gordon Lyons. Gordon, to fault you wrote, you're very, very welcome here to the Health Committee. Um, and I look forward very much, as, as do we all, to working with you in the time ahead and what is obviously... Hugely significant issues for for all of us and for for everyone who we represent. So um, just welcome. In that sense, I also would like to flag up a meeting that I did with the Royal College of Surgeons yesterday. It was an informal meeting on their ten their their action ten steps, not ten years action plan. It was a very very useful session, members. I have to say, and uh, we will continue to engage with the Royal College of Surgeons as we take forward some of the work that the committee is undertaking on waiting lists, which we have identified as a, as a significant priority for us in the time ahead. Um, at yesterday's briefing session, also, there was a, a program was flagged up called Our Hearts, Our Minds, which is run by Dr. Susan Connolly in the Western Trust. It was highlighted as a very good example of a preventative cardiology stream. And it was outlined that there has been difficulty in, in obtaining funding for that program. So um, I wonder would members be content that we would seek further information in relation to that program? Yep, members content, thank you. And the other thing I just do want to flag up is that today is Biomedical Science Day 2021. And I have to say, I, I think the COVID pandemic has highlighted in a, in a very unique but a very clear way, the absolute essential importance of all those people who would have been considered maybe um, back of office or behind the scenes at times, but that whole infrastructure of testing, of laboratories, of tracing, and uh, high quality pathology services are really the backbone of, of a lot of everything else that we do. So I think they go unrecognized and, and uh, at times, so I think it's, it's useful just to flag up that that is, that that is the case that that's happening today. And to thank all of those staff, as we have thanked many other staff for the work they have done in terms of scaling up very quickly the ability to test and, and, and some of that. And I think there is a need actually in the future as we, as we build out of this pandemic and we look to reinforce in public health, I think the whole area of research and biomedical science, testing capacity and technology and experience and, and expertise are going to be crucial steps for us in order to protect the public from ever, we would hope, certainly having to experience a time like we have come through with COVID-19. So well done to all those staff. So uh, members, moving on then to the draft minutes there, I refer you to your uh, draft minutes of the 17th of June, which are tab 3.1 of your pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yeah, members content, thank you. And there are no matters arising then members from those minutes. So we're going to move, I'll just uh, check, Clerk, do we have everyone on the line in terms of panel for the next session on the, our consideration of the Severe Fetal Impairment Abortion Amendment Bill? Yes, we do, Chair. Okay, members, so we're now moving into our first substantive briefing of the day. Um, this is a briefing from uh, 
representatives from Alliance for Choice and for Alliance for Choice Derry are here today to give evidence on the bill. I refer members there to the written submissions received, uh, which are tab 5.1 and tab 5.2 of the pack. So this is a briefing uh, on the first of two evidence sessions today on the severe fetal impairment abortion bill. So we'd now like to welcome by video link, Miss Emma Campbell, who is co-convener for Alliance for Choice. Can you hear us, Emma? I can, thanks. Um, uh, thanks for having me today, Colm, and the rest of the committee. I'd also just like to apologise. I am in the Mac in Belfast and I can't control the windows and there's some drilling outside. So just in case that happens, I apologise in advance. Okay, that, that's grand. That's a, hopefully that'll not be too bad. And we're also joined by Dr. Maeve O'Brien, who's a member of Alliance for Choice Dairy. Are you able to hear me okay, Maeve? I am indeed, Colm. Thanks. Okay, so thank you both to Fajirov. Uh, thank you for coming along to committee. And um, I will just remind members of the panel and members of the committee if people could um, ensure that you're on mute when you're not contributing, and if people have access to headsets, that usually is is a good help to the sound quality. So I will now invite yourselves to give a short five five minute briefing or five minutes each or whatever way you want to divide that, Emma. Um, Brief, brief the committee on on the uh, on your key points, and we will then go to members for some questions and answers. So, if that's okay, if you want to go ahead, Emma. Yeah. So we are um, along with Derry, the largest grassroots group campaigning for abortion rights in Northern Ireland. So we are people who've had abortions, people who support full abortion access, and we're also people who facilitate abortions, even when it was previously illegal. So um, we're mostly concerned that this bill is drafted in bad faith and that the ultimate intentions of the bill, which would be to reduce abortions in certain circumstances, would not have the intended effect and in fact would just make people travel for the same abortion services. So I'm just going to run through a few summaries here. Um, we know from Ireland that legislation that allows abortion in only cases of narrowly defined fetal, fetal anomaly exerts an awful lot of pressure on clinicians to produce indisputable evidence that a fetus won't survive after 28 days of birth. And this strict legal definition doesn't comport with medical understandings and results in many women and pregnant people with heartbreaking diagnosis being exiled to England for treatment. So it really just delays and exacerbates what they're already going through. We've yet to see the full and proper implementation of the abortion regulations in Northern Ireland as laid in March 2020. And we know, you know, we all in this room know why there's a lack of commissioning and a, a, an executive veto on that currently. Um, we really feel it's insulting to every family who have to deal with a severe fetal anomaly that the bill wished to exacerbate their group by making them travel to England, even in the height of a pandemic. Um, we were very heavily involved in producing evidence and uh, individual witnesses for the original CEDAW inquiry and removing any part of those CEDAW recommendations from the current law clearly opens up the Assembly to further legal, legal action as it directly contradicts the measures needed to prevent further breaches of rights. Increasing the legal and political scrutiny in abortions for fetal anomaly would have a negative effect on both the ability of clinicians to fully do their job, but also in any support that can be provided to families that are dealing with that diagnosis, especially if their access to multiple options is restricted by the proposed bill. Now, we understand that the funding of abortions in Northern Ireland um, by the UK government when they have to travel is still going to go ahead and we welcome that. However, we note that this was originally introduced as a stopgap until provision was enacted properly in Northern Ireland. And travel has always um, been said as not a tenable solution to the breaches found in the UN inquiry. In fact, if you read the kind of letter um, to the full in the CDOT inquiry, it reiterates again and again that travel is one of the biggest breaches and we're still forcing families to do that. Um, the difficulties in accessing it um, are, are one thing, but also I think I said at the very start that it doesn't necessarily prevent abortions for the reasons stated in the motion. The only thing that can ameliorate potential discrimination towards having a child with a Down syndrome diagnosis are a wide range of social supports for people with Down syndrome, for their parents and for other measures mentioned above. 
Reintroducing criminalisation doesn't do anything to change the shame associated by being effectively disowned by Northern Ireland because of your pregnancy choices. Um, dis despite the changes that we've already kind of almost got, <laughs> healthcare professionals here still lack clear guidance as to what advice and care and pathways can be offered, and it leaves abortion seekers in the dark. And in our first-hand experience in, in Alliance for Choice in Belfast means people are calling us confused, scared. People quite often say, I don't understand. I thought this was all sorted now, and yet they still don't have access. There have been occasions where we've had to write letters on their behalf to health trusts to ensure that people are getting treatment, and no one should be made to run a gauntlet like that, especially uh, you know, on top of the pregnancy decision that they're having to face in a pandemic. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have at the minute is a lack of public information on any health trust websites, on any Department of Health websites, on what supports and what services are actually available right now. And what we find is over 2,000 people a month use our website to find out information on how to get an abortion in Northern Ireland. And whilst we're happy to provide that information, we're we're a we're an NGO. We are not a, a health provider. We are not an information or, or a statutory body that people should be relying on for that information. And the other problem with that is it can quite often lead people to rogue providers. So people who pretend that they are abortion providers and are actually trying to direct women in a different direction. Um, public opinion polls show that despite a reluctant Northern Ireland Assembly, most notably the majority DUP, citizens in Northern Ireland support abortion law reform and decriminalisation. The most recent survey showed 87% of people are against any criminal penalties, penalties for abortion seekers. And whilst we don't believe that rights should be based on popular opinion, it's indicative of a broader problem of proper representation on issues of social justice in our tribal post-conflict society. Harassment and stigmatizing language are an unnecessary apologies and traumatic additional barrier to the already difficult access to reproductive health health care for people with crisis pregnancies here. But it's allowed to continue unchecked and supported openly by the leading party in Northern Ireland with no consequences for even those um, upon arrest of harassment. Um, the human rights standards recommended by CEDAW Committee in their 2018 report are that abortion on the ground of severe fetal impairment be available to facilitate reproductive choice and autonomy. State parties are obligated to ensure that women's decisions to terminate pregnancies on this ground do not perpetuate stereotypes towards persons with disabilities. Such measures should include the provision of appropriate social and financial support for women who choose to carry such pregnancies to term. Please note the committee expressly recognises the right to abortion on the ground of severe and not just fatal, fatal impairment. That is very clear. Um, my concern is that the bill seeks to limit abortion access, but doesn't seek to put forward any of those measures for extra social and financial support for anybody who's facing one of those decisions. Devolved government in Northern Ireland has a history of stripping away human rights of disabled people, as we've seen through the support of restrictive welfare reform and austerity. If political parties are really concerned by how disabled people are treated, there are many more meaningful ways they can support us, such as reforming, ensuring um, personal assistance, widespread access to health service, a decent standard of living and tackling discrimination against disabled people. Many of the heartbreaking stories that won over the public who voted for a more progressive Ireland and who helped open up conversations in the North were those of people with these diagnoses. To continue to force them to travel to England is to continue a, a shameful history of denying women and pregnant people the ability to decide about their own bodies, lives, families and futures. Party policies can be changed, but the trauma from forced travel for healthcare can't. Um, we wish the Health Committee to note that the person and party who proposed this bill has always voted against all abortion in all circumstances. We would also like to note that there are no bills, as I said before, to extend provision for disabled people, especially disabled women or pregnant people and their particular and special needs, specialist needs when it comes to abortion and maternal health care. It's therefore disingenuous for the motion to claim to make any difference to the lives of disabled people. There are ways that can happen that are embedded into public health and social care systems that don't need to impinge on a pregnant person's bodily autonomy. Finally, 
we would like to reflect that a governing body that attempts to skirt around and avoid recommendations of an international human rights inquiry by undermining the importance of UN treaties or how binding the findings of the inquiry are is one that merely invites further legal scrutiny as, it's, as to its inability to understand or implement fundamental and minimum human rights standards. It's not a good look either for its voting public or in a global setting. And frankly, for us, it's embarrassing. Um, I understand there are a lot of supportive people on the committee <laughs> um, and we wrote this uh, evidence and presentation uh, based on the people and party that proposed this motion. So thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, and um, are, we, are, are we also having a, a presentation by yourself, Maeve, or are we going now to questions and answers? Yes, I have a brief presentation, Mom, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. So go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead, Maeve, certainly. That's great. Just give me a second, Maeve. I just want to check. Just, Maeve, sorry, just pause there a second. Um, yeah, so the, so the clerk is indicating to me that we have an issue with streaming of the with streaming of the meeting, so I may need to pause a few minutes, Maeve, just so we can get the live stream going again in preparation for your presentation. Um, clerk, can you advise if we are going to suspend the meeting or if we stay online? Um, thanks, Chair. If we stay online, I'm hoping it's resolved in the next few seconds. So, yeah, so I'm just okay. checking now to see if it's... Um, okay, so I, I can just ask everyone to pause, but, but to remain to remain conscious that we, we could be on online. Um, so we are in public session, even though we have paused the, the committee meeting. So I'll, I'll wait till I hear back from you, Dan Clark, to hear that we have either a resolution or that we're going to proceed. Yes, yeah, sure. We, we've had a confirmation that there's an issue on the Assembly's website, but that we're streaming live on both YouTube and uh, Facebook at the minute. So it, it is going out live. It's just there it seems to be an issue with the Assembly's website. So we're okay to continue. Okay. 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 Thank you. And apologies for the disruption there, Maeve. But if you would like to go ahead now and resume with your presentation, go ahead. Not at all, Colin. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to the uh, Stormont Health Committee for hearing Alliance for Choice Dairy speak today. It's um, very, very, uh, very decent of you all. And we look forward to hopefully working with you all um, in future. Um, so really today, folks, um, I'm just going to give a brief statement from Alliance for Choice Dairy. Um, we submitted evidence, as you know, regarding the severe fatal impairment abortion bill. And while we will leave it to healthcare professionals to outline the nuances of why this bill is deeply pro problematic. We would like to state that the discourse surrounding this bill has been subject to much misinformation. Um, Paul Given has inaccurately suggested that Clause 1 will increase or pressure women and pregnant people to seek terminations for pregnancies in cases of uncomplicated Down syndrome, cleft lip palate and club foot. Um, this is an inaccurate and misleading claim, and we would refer you to the stringent General Medical Council regulations, as well as words from healthcare professionals, both in Northern Ireland and as members of um, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Royal College of Midwives, to illustrate this point really clearly. Um, and accordingly, in agreement with those experts, we strongly condemn the bill, which is neither rooted in fact nor best practice healthcare for women in Northern Ireland. Um, I think it's interesting just to note that statistics from England and Wales indicate that the abortions over 24 weeks only accounted for 0.1% of all procedures. So what this means is that Paul Givens' bill is targeting a minority of people and families who will experience much wanted but complex pregnancy scenarios. And ultimately, this misguided bill will put pressure on this 0.1% to make healthcare decisions before 24 weeks gestation. Preventing abortion access beyond 24 weeks is ill-considered Ill Ill and it's cruel because very serious abnormalities are only detected at the 20-week scan or later, which really leaves a four-week window between receiving this news and, and being able to make a decision um, as, as is right for yourself and your family. And in addition, despite this bill being modelled as a protection for disabled people, it in fact erases and victimizes disabled people who also need access to reproductive health care. 
As we've seen in the case of Sarah Yurch, the traumatic result of restricted abortion access in Northern Ireland has meant that women have been forced to travel to Great Britain for essential health care. And as a result, they don't receive the proper support or aftercare that they need. And what this bill will do is it will mean that there's a continuation of these painful journeys and our shameful history of exporting tragedy in Northern Ireland will continue. We will be abandoning women and pregnant people in their time of need. And as grassroots activists here in, in Derry and the Northwest and in rural areas, uh, we have for decades helped women in Northern Ireland procure abortions. And we want to explain to you guys exactly what will happen on the ground if this bill goes through. So if a woman is given a diagnosis of serious abnormalities in and around a 20 week scan, which is the earliest date in Northern Ireland, such diagnosis can be given. And this woman decides that she wants to terminate. She has to make her decision and will find a way to have an abortion regardless of availability here. We know this because we have assisted women in their choice to do this. And we know this because figures from the UK government show that in 2020, during the coronavirus pandemic, um, seven women a week travelled from Northern Ireland to England uh, to have abortion health care. So we know that once women make their decisions, come hell or high water, they will realise that decision. Um, and, you know, in this scenario, Paul Givens' bill will mean that having been given a diagnosis of severe fatal impairment at 20 weeks, there's a four week window for a woman to make a decision whether to carry on with her pregnancy. And, and what goes on in this four week window? Um, we've got, you know, you have to have time to come to terms with your diagnosis. You then have to organize the scheduling of further testing to really get to grips with the situation, what's happening. And then you want to maybe try and explore supports that might help families and women continue to choose their, to, to, to choose going on with their pregnancy. But if Stormont imposes this strict time limit, you will in effect be pressuring women to make a decision about their family planning in an extremely short space of time. And as a result, you know, this heightened tension, this pressure will hurt women with likely much wanted pregnancies by forcing them to make a rush decision without adequate time to reflect and process the information they have been given. So not only does this have a really traumatic effect in the short term for women, it has an untold impact on her family, her mental health and in any further pregnancies going forward. So Alliance for Choice Dairy, we can decisively say that limiting time for decisions will drive desperate and traumatise women to travel to England or seek dangerous backstreet options. And if this bill passes, please make no mistake that this is explicitly the situation Stormont is creating. We would argue that what Stormont needs to do is provide the best care available for women to make informed decisions. And this requires time. So the imposition of restrictions in this regard will, will only pressure women to make decisions before they're ready. And we just want to demonstrate this point. We spoke to person A who described how this bill would affect her um, going forward. So this is person A who says to us, in 2016, I was diagnosed with Brugada syndrome following genetic testing due to a sudden cardiac arrest in my family. Brugada symptom is a rare genetic condition that is usually only diagnosed once a sudden cardiac arrest occurs and there is no treatment. I was told that it was likely any children I have will have the same condition and they would have to undergo the similar testing, need frequent monitoring, um, access ac across their lives and are likely to experience a cardiac arrest. So person A became pregnant in 2017 and she said, knowing this child would also likely have the same condition as me and that my health would be at risk. I was not only thinking about the immediate future, but I had to imagine a situation where this child or or I might have a sudden cardiac arrest. Person A then went on to say, if I was placed in the position of a woman who faced a, severe, a diagnosis of a severe fatal impairment, I would not have had adequate time to make a decision and take into consideration or cope with all the information I was given. It is cruel to force pregnant people and their families to make life-changing decisions in a matter of weeks. The pregnant person is the only one who knows if they can cope with a pregnancy and understands the impact it will have on their life and the life of their family. 
So that's from person A, and we're very grateful to her for that perspective. Um, so what Stormont really needs to do here, folks, is reject this bill, provide funding for better antenatal screening, and put through very clear guidance for clinicians to support medics and women who are affected by severe fatal impairment diagnosis. And just on this note, we understand that this term, severe fatal impairment, has been manipulated by those who would seek to restrict women's healthcare choices. And really, we'd like to take this opportunity to affirm our support to the clinicians at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as fetal medicine experts, um, who in its strictest adherence with general medical council regulations, provide empathetic care and we trust our medical professionals and we really must take our lead from them. As activists in the Northwest, we fully support the right for women to decide what is best for them and their families in consultation with their doctors. And we believe this is a private matter that should not be interfered with. We would ask Stormont, do you think so little of women? Do you believe that the women of Northern Ireland are so callous that restrictions on their health care are necessary? Finally, in response to some of the narratives regarding abortion and morality that have been heard by people uh, with extreme religious views in these sessions, um, Elias for Choice Dairy would posit that it is in fact the height of immorality to put women and pregnant people into situations where they are forced to give birth. And we'd like to turn to some words from the Christian clinician, Dr. Willie Parker, who provides abortions in the United States. And he talks about how the scripture came alive for him. And it spoke to me. For the Samaritan, the person in need was a fallen traveler. For me, it was a pregnant woman. The earth spun and with it, this question turned on its head. It became not, is it right for me as a Christian to perform abortions, but rather, is it right for me as a Christian to refuse to do them? So with this in mind, we would urge the Stormont Health Committee to remember the diverse theological perspectives on the issue of abortion and remind members that regardless of your own personal feelings on the matter, your job is to enact health care in line with human rights regulations. And it is then up to service users to privately make their own decisions. Providing access so that women can have abortions at home, surrounded by their family, midwives, consultants, and fetal medical experts is the most sensible decision medically, economically, and emotionally for women in Northern Ireland. As activists, we know that those who have been forced to travel to England for abortion services often experience trauma due to having to travel and go through this healthcare without their support networks. This bill will cause deep harm to these women and their families, and it is imperative that it is not brought into law. Thank you very much for hearing us this morning. Okay, thank you, Maeve, and thank you both for your presentations. So a couple of questions from me, and then I will go to members. And if I can just advise everyone that all streams are now working, so the Assembly live feed is also now streaming the meeting. So thank you for that. So um, going back to your, uh, your presentation then, Emma, You'd mentioned early on in relation to that the bill could put pressure on clinicians to provide indisputable evidence. Could you elaborate a bit on what you mean by that um, and what the impact of that could be? Um, there's currently situations in the 26 counties um, which have a law similar to what's being proposed in this bill um, that requires doctors to provide irrefutable evidence that the condition means that the child will die within 28 days of the pregnancy. This is an almost impossible diagnosis as anyone in this room who has experience of relatives within end of life care, it's, it's almost impossible for doctors to make those kind of absolute decisions. Um, and what has effectively happened is that even people who are, um, who could be argued to be within the law, in the 26 counties are still traveling to England for those services. Um, and so really it means that it's just not available. It's not available at all because the clinicians, with the reintroduction of any level of criminalization, the clinicians are rightly worried about the impact on them being able to provide all the other services that they provide. 
Okay, thank you. And the other thing that both of you touched upon was the issue of support. And um, I think, Amy, you had said that, that there was a, a wide range, there, there would need to be a wide range of social supports in place. So what what type of supports would need to be in place and what, what type of deficits are there currently available here uh, in the north? You know, what, what, are, what are the key issues that areas of support that don't exist? Um, well, really specifically for uh, disabled women and people that can get pregnant in Northern Ireland, there's a huge lack of understanding reproductive health care. For uh, disabled people and people with disabled children in Northern Ireland, we all know that there's um, a lack of specialist school services that in the last decade um, supports uh, in, for instance, the kind of the new approaches of universal credit have really meant that people have had their, their kind of welfare massively slashed, um, which does nothing to help people. The, the countries that have the greatest supports for people with disabilities are the countries where um, where people where disabled people are happier, and that's what we should be aiming for, not to restrict anybody's um, reproductive um, healthcare decisions. There's also something else that I think, just because of the time, um, we, neither of us got to talk about, and that's that if families travel over to England for this particular type of reproductive health care, they will be forced once again to make a decision on the airline that they use based on whether that airline will transport fetal remains in a cool box for them. And we should never be making anybody to make that decision. Okay, thank you. So I'm going, I'm going to go to members then. And at, at this point in time, I have indications from Paula, Carol, Jonathan, and Jerry, so I'll be going. To, I'll be going to members in that order. Um, so uh, uh, again, I would ask members just to be conscious of the sensitive and and nature of the issue that we're considering here, and to be aware of that at all times. So I'll go first of all to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. And um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, ladies, for your presentations this morning. Um, I, I was watching the news last night um, and you'll see that in Scotland they're facing this issue with the mother and baby homes at the minute and how women decades ago were forced to make decisions at a time of huge emotional stress um, in an environment of huge t taboo and shame. And I have likened uh, the, this bill and what is happening to women in terms of accessing a reproductive health care as our modern day mother and baby home scandal. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk to the issue of the way that this will continue to oppress women in our society here. Thank you. Um, so one of our members, Ashley Topley, was involved in the Supreme um, Court case uh, that eventually um, was moved back here that uh, Sarah Yurt took forward. Now, Ashley, because of the inability of her to make that decision quickly, which wasn't really on Ashley, which was on a, a delay of being able to find a consultant in here to get the testing in time and so forth. Um, Ashley missed her opportunity to access an abortion and she had to carry her pregnancy for 14 weeks, knowing that it wasn't going to survive. Whenever she saw people in public, which she eventually stopped doing because it was so traumatic, people would be congratulating her because she was very clearly um, and visibly pregnant and she had to tell people that she was, you know, her baby was going to die. Um, it was incredibly traumatic for Ashley to the point where the Health Trust still provides a psychologist for Ashley over six years later. Why on earth would we ask to go back to that again? Why on earth would we force carrying a pregnancy for 14 weeks knowing that it's not going to survive? Um, Ashley also had to have quite um, intense pain injections throughout the end of her pregnancy. If it had been a, a normal, healthy pregnancy, um, those injections wouldn't have been given, you know, to a pregnant woman because of the risk it would pose to the fetus. So um, I think uh, there's only there's only one reason that this bill has been proposed, and given the background and beliefs of the person that proposed it, I think we all know why. Thank you, um, Emma, and I'll maybe direct my question to you, Maeve. Um, thank you for your um, for highlighting the the discourse around this bill and the misinformation out there. Last week, Dr. Jonathan Manderson, fetal medicines consultant, I mean, he knocked it out of the park. How ridiculous it is that any of them of that level of expertise 
and training would ever uh, abort or terminate just on the basis of a club foot and cleft palate. And so I just want to um, ask what the sentiment is that up there in the dairy area regarding the stop-start nature of the um, services in the Western Trust and how that's impacting in terms of that sort of rural um, community. Thank you. Yes, Paula, thank you very much. Um, we are actually in the process of uh, lobbying with the, the Western Trust um, because I'm sure, as, as you all know, the early medical abortion services had collapsed in the Western Trust, leaving a healthcare inequality for women in the Western Trust area. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with uh, people on the ground who, who, again, as Emma said, you know, are coming to us, coming to activists um, for, for, for medical help um, and, and the stigma and shame that's created as a result of the collapse of services um, it is really, you know, producing a real chill factor there. So we have, you know, women um, self-administering. We have women um, looking for pills online and afraid to reach out to their GPs, afraid to reach out to their healthcare providers. Um, so it's it's a really, really difficult situation up here um, in the Northwest at the moment. And, um, you know, we're, we're hoping we're working to resolve that. Um, as well, I would just note, you know, that, that throughout the pandemic, um, Informing Choices Northern Ireland has had, you know, so many uh, service users uh, throughout the pandemic. We know that seven women a week have travelled uh, to GB uh, during the pandemic year as well. Um, this is ongoing. We, we have women who are deeply distressed, women who are attempting suicide, uh, reach out to us. Um, and it really shouldn't be that way. We need the healthcare infrastructure in place. Uh, we need it done professionally uh, to the letter of the law. And, um, you know, we just need to sort of grow up now and and, and roll out these services. Thank you very much. And thank you, ladies, um, to both your organisations for your work. It's just been fantastic. Thank you. OK, thank you, Paula. And going then to Carl Nikhelen. Carl Gore, Lidahol. Gormel, good Kevrily. Um, thank you, Emma and Mev, for your presentations here. Very, very compelling. Um, I just want to pick up on, first of all, the Paula mentioned the issue of the fatal or the fetal medical experts and indeed obstetricians as RCM and NIACT have all presented. But the two um, uh, witnesses last week were almost insulted. They were insulted. They were, it wasn't almost. They were insulted that the people behind this bill are suggesting that terminations are happening because someone has a club foot or a cleft palate um, uh, or non-complicated downs. And that that is, was very, very clear. Uh, mm. They were clearly hurt. But the other issue I want to raise is that in the middle of a global pandemic, Informant Choices also told us at this committee that at least seven women per week that they know of, but they suspected probably there were more, were forced to travel um, for terminations. And I guess uh, the situation, I know we've seen it in Uri around um, people protesting, uh, anyone, any women trying to access healthcare. Um, I just want your thoughts on that because I, the, the witness, I can't remember her name from NIACT, but certainly RCM told us that nurses other medical professionals have to escort women to their vehicles because of the abuse that they're receiving. And despite all that, and despite this bill, women are still travelling to Britain to terminate, and mostly in a, a situation where it was a wanted pregnancy, but there's no other option. So I just want your views on that. And then the second thing I want to say is, and it's just to have it in the record, and I appreciate your sentiments, Emma, about... Uh, the blockages uh, and vetoing of rights. But what I do want to say is we're now sitting um, after agreement on the continuation of welfare rights, protections and mitigations, and indeed the protections and mitigations for our most vulnerable, including the disabled, and they need to progress as well. So we have people who are for rights and we have people who are against rights, and you can make your mind up who's who. But in relation to the protests at women trying to access healthcare, um, do you believe that if this bill is passed, that that too will have an impact on women and indeed professionals working 
trying to provide health care, including reproductive health care for women and pregnant people. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Maybe um, I'll go first on this one because yesterday, actually, in in Coleraine, we're seeing an escalation of um of problems um on the Castle Rock Road in in Coleraine, and then there's weekly protests at the Waterside Health Centre in Derry City as well. Um, and you know the Derry City and Strabane District Council um have voted in support of buffer zones. I know Belfast have done the same. I'm sure Emma can talk a little more to that. Um, you know, so I think that the real key issue here is that it's it's not about denying someone's right to protest. It's about saying, you know, protest, don't protest outside, a, you know, a healthcare center, a place where women are going into for for whatever reason, you know, to to avail of um, medical care, and you know, it's 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 frightening for women, it's frightening for their children, as we see in Uri. Um and we're really seeing grassroots groups like supporting women Uri, for example, um, you know, going off their own bat there with very little support, uh, you know, from their councils, from the police, um, you know, to to protect other members of, of their community. And I think that's something that going forward really has to be um, a key issue, um, you know, to, to, to extend. And Carol, just to, to uh, take up on your point there as well about the medical professionals, you know, um, I've been watching these healthcare committees and the, the suggestion that there would be coercion, for example, uh, by medical professionals to women to abort has been abhorrent. Um, you know, the, these medical professionals, these are the people who tend to are, are wounded, are sick, who are motivated to this job through a deep sense of empathy and care. You know, the, the suggestion that, that medics can somehow skirt the lines between the, the strict GMC regulations, um, and that their life's work, and that's what, that's what the medical profession is. It's a calling. It's a call to a life's work that they would coerce women, that they would have, um, you know, medical procedures willy nilly, which is the narrative that's been peddled is is absolutely disgraceful and it's so disrespectful to these professionals who have you know been the linchpin especially in Northern Ireland uh, through the decades so I really do think that we need to take our lead from these professionals um, and just kind of cut cut this false narrative um, and, and put our trust in, in the people that we put our trust in in the worst days of our lives. Uh, uh, thanks Daniel. Um, I our experience in Belfast, particularly around College Street, um, where there's so today in about an hour and a half, that um, street will be full of anti-choice protesters. Some of them with quite um, graphic and let's face it, completely inaccurate images that are designed to scare people. Um, one of one of the things that I wanted to bring up as well is we have taken calls quite regularly from people who have been through the hands of Stanton Healthcare. And very recently, I had a call from someone who was shake, clearly shaken and crying on the other end of the phone, who had been three times for appointments with them under the illusion that they were uh, an abortion providing clinic in Northern Ireland. Um, what happens is that they take women in under the belief that they're going to get abortion health care. They send them for scans at a private scanning center to purposely try and delay them beyond the 10 weeks, which is what is essentially most available for people in Northern Ireland at the moment. Um, uh, this woman, once it was very clear to the people in Stanton that this woman wasn't going to change her mind, they started being quite abusive to her. And that was the point that she realized that maybe, maybe these aren't legitimate providers after all. The same organization are advertising um, abortion reversal pills, as you may have known, all, all across the north. Um, and this same abortion reversal pill medicine has seen a doctor in England struck off for offering that same abortion reversal. It's dangerous. Um, it's not be, and there was one study that began in America on it and it became so harmful for people causing lots of unnecessary, um, bleeding during their pregnancy. So quite harmful, um, that it's been stopped. Um, I don't understand how they are allowed to do this with impunity, how they are allowed to pretend that they are an abortion clinic and how they're allowed to bring people in. And if we had accurate, up-to-date information on statutory um, statutory websites, we believe that this wouldn't happen. 
Because of this, and I'm sure the doctors, if you ask, because I've spoken to them, would also testify that people have come through their doors in a panic after being um, uh, taken in by Stanton. And make no mistake, the people who are running Stanton are the same people standing outside the clinic in College Street in Belfast. And it's really unacceptable. I've also spoken to the people who run the um, businesses across the street in College Street in Belfast. And they are... Um, they said on Thursdays, nobody comes anywhere near their shops anymore. This is the centre of Belfast on a Thursday afternoon and no one comes near their shops anymore because they're too scared to deal with these anti-choice protesters. Um, I think any bill that purposely tries to limit reproductive choice for women will give ammunition to groups like this to continue. Um, yeah, so Gora Maggot. Thank, thank you both. I, I, I'm old enough to remember the Brick Clinic and what happened there. And it wasn't acceptable then, and it most definitely isn't acceptable now. So I just want to put my gratitude on the record to you both. And indeed, uh, many, many people that you are working with. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And uh, going then to Jonathan Buckley. Jonathan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, here you okay, Jonathan? Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Emma and May, for your for your presentations. Uh, I suppose probably first and foremost, I would say it has been mentioned by one of the participants about our primary objective is to provide health care. I just want to state my, my primary objective is to save lives, and that has and will continue to inform my decision making on this committee. Um, I'd first of all like to ask Emma a question, if that is okay. Um, in your submission uh, for Alliance for Choice, you expressed concerns that the bill before us today, uh, because you say it would lead to a little background noise. Yes, yeah, sorry, apologies. There's a drill outside and the window's open. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, in your, your submission, you expressed concerns that the bill before us today, uh, you said, would lead to the recriminalization of women. The 2020 regulations so are very clear. Regulation 11A, where the SFI does not amend in any way, and that there is no context in the regulations where the mother can be criminalised. Given that the bill we are discussing does not criminalise or, or recriminalise the mother, why would you suggest that it does? Um. This is a bit like the Jonathan. Lamar just, just, just. Sorry, Emma. Emma, before you, before you come in there, Jonathan, just to say, Jonathan, a lot of that feedback seems to be coming from your end. So I'm just not yeah, sure if you can grab a, a set it, but yeah, I'm, sure, I'm not sure. Question. I'm not sure what is that because I can actually hear feeding back from your line as well. It's okay. almost like a delay. Okay, the line. It seems to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, we caught the question anyway, so hopefully we'll be able to work work our way through that. So go ahead, Emma. Um. It. It is very similar to the likes of the Morrow Bill that attempted to criminalize um, people that purchase um, sex rather than sex workers. But what in effect actually happens is the criminalization of sex workers. And we think that this is um, very similar to what is being proposed in this bill, where you um, seek to effectively criminalize or um, punish healthcare providers, what you ultimately end up doing is punishing the people that are seeking those healthcare services in the first place. Um, and I, I do think that, um, you know, my understanding of signing up to be part of uh, the UK means that you're signing up to be part of all of the international human rights treaties that they have ratified, which includes the CEDAW treaty and the CEDAW inquiry therefore falls under that treaty. And so to deny that ratification of that human rights treaty is to deny you're part of the union. Okay, should we continue, sure, yes. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, in, in your present and your submission, you also stated it is very concerning to see anti choice spokespeople using the lives of people with disabilities as political footballs and to see anti choice myths about conditions such as Down syndrome making their way into everyday conversation. You know, what is striking to me, and I suppose uh, I know most of the evidence that, that you both have, have, have talked about is probably directed at the political aspect of this in terms of the position political parties have taken, in, including my own in relation to the pro-life argument. But what is striking is we have received evidence in favour of the bill 
uh, from two Down, Down syndrome uh, disability charities and a number of what you would describe as anti-choice groups uh, that have condemned the bill. Uh, what would you say or have to say to the disability charities that are calling on the Assembly to pass this legislation? Is it fair or is there to, to call them as anti-choice given their, their record of, of trying to help those with disabilities in everyday life? Alliance for Choice has worked very closely with um, disabled people, uh, disabled women and people that can get pregnant. We have a whole um, uh, course that we did with a whole lot of participants, some of whom had disabled children as well. Now, I don't think that anybody who has ever been in the situation of Sarah Ewart or Ashley Topley would want to uh, limit their choice in any way. I'm prepared to accept that some people have a different opinion, but what we also believe very strongly in Alliance for Choice, that the intentions of this bill are misguided. Nothing in this bill would prevent any of the abortions that it's talked about from happening. They would just happen in England, in a different place, and they would involve um, very severe trauma for the people for reasons that we talked about already, like having to try and find someone who will transport the fetal remains for a proper burial back to Northern Ireland on a low budget airline. Uh, and we don't think that's acceptable. There are also um, uh, disabled women who've made um, submissions to the committee in support of the bill. So um, I'm not sure really what you're trying to say. Well, uh, your submission talks about anti-choice spokespeople. So what I would like to ask is, do you hold to the position that Down syndrome disability charities that have presented uh, in favour of the bill are described as anti-choice? Um, some people are against abortion in all circumstances, like many people um, in the DUP, and that's completely up to them. However, that is not um, allowing people to make their own decisions about their pregnancy, and a bill like this would exactly do that. It would prevent people from making their own decisions, um, and someone else's beliefs shouldn't be affecting somebody else's health care. You're quite within your rights to have those beliefs, but it shouldn't be impacting on other people's access to healthcare. Okay, I, I noticed you haven't answered that one directly. I think also Sarah, you uh, made clear that she was not supporting abortion for disability as well. Uh, but I note you haven't uh, made specific references to you stand over that claim that they're anti-choice. Um, I know my questions are probably running out, but may have, I have one for you if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> last month, Tommy Jessup, yeah, an actor who has Down syndrome, who recently appeared in the popular BBC crime drama Line of Duty, publicly said, I want to see people with Down syndrome treated equally with others before and after they are born. We are the only group of people in the United Kingdom where people try to end our lives before we are born just because we have Down syndrome. This is not fair. It scars our lives and causes mental health problems. How would you justify opposing the bill to people like Tommy Jessup. Jonathan, thank you. Um, very emotional statement. Um, what I would really ask is that you would consider and that we all consider the people making a decision, the women making decisions to have an abortion. You know, they're not monsters. They are women in our communities. They are sisters, our friends. You know, do we think so little of women that they would just willy nilly decide, you know, oh, you know, I'll just do something that is that is you know very light and and easy, you know. Do you think that the women of this region are so cruel as as to act in that way, as to do what the the quote that you've just read out? I have never described any woman as a monster uh, or, or criminal for for doing anything. I mean, if I'm simply asking how you would respond to the statement made by Tommy Jessup. Yes. relation to how uh, the, those with Down syndrome feel as a result of uh, um, a bill like this being opposed. But Jonathan, you can't talk about a, that in the abstract. The, the, the situation is that women make a decision 
whether to continue their pregnancy or not based on medical advice, based on the supports available to them, based on their ability to continue on with their personal journey. Do you think that women are so callous as to not take into concern all of those issues? Do you think that women would do what, what Tommy has, has said? I think the public discourse around people with disabilities, in particular Down syndrome in itself, uh, is discriminatory. Uh, I think that um, the, the, if we look at statistics in England, for example, 69% of women offered a termination in the same con conversation as receiving a positive diagnosis test for Down syndrome. 50% of women who have a high chance result offered a termination a second time, having already refused it once. Uh, I think what Tommy is highlighting, and indeed what many people who have written to me uh, as, as their, their MLA in relation to this bill, are concerned as to the impact that, and the stigmatism that is continuing as a result uh, of, of those opposing this bill and the new abortion regulations that have been put through in Westminster, there is a deep concern as to the rights of, of the unborn in particular, in this instance, those with uh, disabilities such as Down syndrome. So it's in that context that Tommy, I'm reading this statement from Tommy and I would, I would, I would, I would, like, sorry, I would like to know your response as to how you would respond to a person like Tommy in this instance. Of course. Well, I could put yourself at ease that um, in England and Wales in 2019, um, we know there was around a total of 12 abortions after 24 weeks were, uh, were carried out where Down syndrome was mentioned. Um, if you speak to the many medical professionals who have taken the time to speak to the health committee, you will know that um, Down syndrome alone is not um, a qualifier for abortion um, in, in the sense of this bill. It is a you know, a complicating factor. So you're dealing with very severe fatal impairments. You speak to your medical, listen to the medical doctors. You know, do you know, doctors are, um, they, they work, um, with severe impairments, which are wide ranging and can include chromosomal abnormalities, congenital anomalies and anomalies related to the nervous system in context with Down syndrome. So we are talking about severe impairments here. We're talking about the most extreme cases in this given bill that are allowing women a four week window to make a huge decision. If I would posit, Jonathan, if that you really cared about, you know, preserving life, preserving choices for women, allowing women the time to think, can I cope with this? Can I continue on with this? A four week window is surely counterintuitive to that objective. Yes, there's actually okay, thank you. Thank sorry, you. evidence to show that Bye, briefly, Emma, I want to move on. Okay. Um, there's evidence to show that forcing women to make a decision quickly actually uh, increases the number of abortion decisions for various reasons. It doesn't decrease them in any way. Um, and I think what Jonathan um, has failed to be able to answer or anyone in his party, um, what exactly the party is doing for people um, who have Down syndrome, um, aside from a bill that's trying to restrict people's reproductive rights. Okay, I'm going to move on to other members. We've, we've, uh, we've taken a substantial amount of time there. Um, I'm going to move to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, go or I, let it hold. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Emma and, and Maeve. And uh, I think I was at the inaugural Alliance for Choice meeting uh, many years ago, so just to declare a, 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 a interest there and, and to say fair play to Emma and Maeve and all the important uh, advisory, but campaign and work you do. I think Alliance for Choice is a really, really important organisation, so I just want to say thanks for um, all, uh, all your work. Um, I think, Emma, you touched upon it uh, more um, than Maeve, so maybe I can ask you to tease out. I mean, we're. Uh, I think the, pre the written presentation talks about uh, from Alliance for Choice the anti disability discrimination being a real issue in our society, which it obviously uh, is. And um, Alliance for Choice are adamant about not rolling back uh, on on rights for for people with disabilities or who, who are disabled or people who are uh, pregnant and need uh, terminations. Um, I mean, if you want, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it this morning, but uh, there was a report by the uh, Ombudsman this morning to say that people, too many people uh, on PIP, personal independence payment, had their uh, claims unfairly uh, rejected. Um, 
as far as I'm aware, um, Paul Gibbon isn't bringing a, a bill to uh, overturn uh, PIP, which obviously is a benefit for people with disabilities. Uh, so I think there is a lot of um, uh, bogus arguments about standing up for disabilities behind the aims of this uh, of this bill. Um, so just as a as a as a as a as a first point, um, uh, and then obviously the uh, yeah, sorry, excuse me, one second. Um, yeah, the the, the the idea that um, limiting uh, sort of time for for people to make a decision around uh, termination uh, to you know before twenty three weeks, even though it's difficult after twelve weeks, doesn't actually stop but actually increases um, abortions. I think is is very very important um, as well. Uh, and just just one other point, and then I'll, I'll do a, a quick follow up. Um, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, recently about uh, divergence on uh, trade. And the protocol, uh, sausages, and, and all this kind of whatever you want to view it as issues. Um, but I mean, just maybe if you could speak briefly to the kind of divergence on on services uh, for for women uh, in the north in terms of some of the trusts, but also the, the, the limitations uh, currently and what fears you have, and um, that that those would be extended with this bill if it were to pass. Um, yes, we're really uncomfortable that this bill ha has even been proposed long before any uh, commissioning of services has happened. The fact that we have services up to 10 weeks is testament to the health providers on the ground and the medical professionals who scramble together to make provision happen without the support of the Department of Health. Um, and, you know, I, we were we were so frustrated at the start of lockdown um, we were we were having dozens of calls a day. We were people were at their wits' end, not knowing where to go, what to do. We had uh, young women living in a house with their parents, saying, "I'm we're all supposed to be self isolating. How can I get out of the house to get access?" And um, we we are still an outlier as the only um, jurisdiction in the whole of the UK and Ireland that doesn't have access to telemedicine in the height of a global pandemic, despite it being recommended by the World Health Organization and the UN. It is actually a disgrace. On paper, we have now one of the best laws in Europe because um, it uses the text of the human rights inquiry that happened in Northern Ireland and it was based on the evidence of the women that it interviewed and the medical professionals that they spoke to. Um, I think any bill that's trying to limit people's reproductive choices, I mean, that's all it's doing. It's trying to limit people's reproductive choices. And again, it's not based on every, where is the evidence that they have that shows that a move like this would in any way make any less of those abortions happen? There is no evidence. They can't provide that evidence. And in fact, to the opposite number, we have very clear evidence from the 26 counties in Ireland who have a similar bill as what, or a similar law as what's being proposed, that people are still traveling over in their hundreds to England to access the care. And if there, uh, you know, if there are parties on this call who, who are working towards a 32 county country, then in no way should we be relying on England to pick up our, um, healthcare. That, that we find personally distasteful. That's not how healthcare works, and it should never be how healthcare works. Um, I know that there's uh, a lot of people on the ground in the country who are just dismayed and confused that there is still no real access. We should have um, access uh, for mental or health reasons, mental health or health reasons, up to 24 weeks, essentially, with the sign off of two doctors. That's not happening. There's a cutoff of 10 weeks. Uh, apologies for that noise. There's a cut off at ten weeks, and then there's a cliff edge, and people have to go and find their abortion healthcare um, in in other ways. Um, I'll let me have jump in here. No, Emma, just um, in absolute agreement, really, and um, it's it's just it's unacceptable, you know, as someone that works. Uh, with women on the ground, you know, we, as Emma has said, we have people calling us in tears, calling us, you know, desperate for, for help and assistance. Um, and, uh, you know, this is not how healthcare should be run. If it's not, you know, something that you personally agree with, that's absolutely fine. But the job of government is to provide the institutions to, to eliminate healthcare inequalities and provide access to free, safe, legal, local abortion. Um, you know, that's the bare minimum. And it, again, it's really time just to get the services commissioned, ensure 
protections for staff and service users of the trusts and and let's just move on thank you and just a quick follow-up um i mean, I mean the the description of the fetal remain sort of uh um, experience of, of women is quite horrendous and to me it obviously um, points to people who are, are parties who are on the abortion just really don't want to consider that or, or take that in, into the consideration of when they're designing bills or legislation. There's obviously a lack of post-mortem services uh, for, for women as well which is hasn't been uh, addressed uh, or talked about and then finally um, it was mentioned in your, in your written presentation um, uh, Emma and Maeve, but could you maybe speak to the difficulties for uh, migrant women and people of colour in terms of ac getting access to abortion um, and uh, services now, but also any further barriers that would be in place if this bill um, uh, were, were to pass? And uh, thank you for, for coming this morning. Thanks, Jerry. Well, I'm going to draw attention for, for Emma just to the situation again in the Western Trust where, um, you know, all women, um, are, are not able to avail of early medical abortion. Um, in terms of migrant women, you know, you have women who, um, uh, you know, depending on their community background, may need to to speak to doctors privately. The, the barriers to that um, are, are, are so pronounced. You know, you have women who um, they don't know where to turn to. They turn to people like us. They turn to uh, places like Stanton Healthcare, um, you know, and and uh, are, are misinformed. The lack of telemedicine in this region, as Emma rightly pointed out, the only region in, in the British Isles and Republic of Ireland that doesn't have telemedicine, again, inhibits. Um, so it's it's uh, what, what white women experience. It's only pronounced uh, more difficulties, more barriers for, for women of colour um, in Northern Ireland. Yeah, there was um, a study uh, in 2019 um, that specifically interviewed women of colour and immigrant women, um, and it said that they described an unexpected personal tragedy when faced with a prenatal diagnosis of a fetal anomaly. And they really emphasised the importance of respectful and empathetic psychological support, which they wouldn't get if they had to travel. Um, their experiences of insufficient and incomprehensible information call attention to the importance of tailored approaches so we need to think about them access um, through an unfamiliar language and probably with far fewer um, social networks of support than than um, settled communities have here. Travel to England becomes intensely more complicated when your migration status is at risk or you have a complex visa arrangements. Similarly students who Northern Ireland is trying to attract all the time from overseas, often find travel difficult due to the restrictions of their student visas. So often they can't even travel to access abortion health care. Um, or if anyone accessing abortion in, in Northern Ireland currently requires a really complicated navigation of the health system, which it shouldn't. Most GPs and hospital staff um, don't even know who to, we, we also have had GPs phone us to ask us what the pathway to care is, and that just shouldn't be happening. These complications are going to make it more difficult for women um, who, who don't have English as their first language or don't maybe have access to the internet or the networks of women who have always given help to other women in Northern Ireland. They might not have those networks. And if they're new to the country, they just don't have the same access to the information or know where to get help. So um, I really think whatever problems that we already have, um, people, uh, migrant women and women of colour are going to face that, you know, threefold. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. I'm going to move on. And if I could ask the remaining members who have now indicated that they would like in for a question, if I could ask members and panel to be as brief as possible. I'm very conscious of time now and we do have uh, several additional sessions. So um, I'll go then to Gordon Lyons. Go ahead, Gordon, please. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Emma uh, and Maeve, uh, for your evidence today. Uh, look, you'll not be surprised to hear that I come from a different perspective uh, on this issue, having regard to uh, both mother uh, and child. I recognise, however, Emma, that you have said that you are prepared to accept that some people have, have different opinions, and, and that is that is welcome. Um, however, could I just caution against um, um, some of the, the words that were used earlier to describe people that had previously given evidence to the committee as coming from uh, extreme religious positions. Um, these, um, uh, I think, are fairly mainstream uh, uh, for, for many people. And, and I know that you, you take issue with um, the proposer of this bill and, and his political party. But I think it's, it's important that we actually keep it focused uh, on the issue itself. And 
Uh, I suppose I just have um, some very brief questions. And um, the first one is around the comment that you uh, have made within your submission, uh, which is that you have difficulty with the term abortion for disability because it immediately affords the fetus personhood and only a person can uh, be, uh, only a born person can be described uh, as disabled. Uh, I find that a, an, an unusual uh, comment to make, and I suppose that's in contradiction with the 2020 regulations as well, um, because what this bill is trying to do is to amend the 2020 regulations uh, insofar as it says if the child were born, it would suffer from such physical or mental impairment as to be seriously uh, disabled. Um, so that's the term that's actually used within the regulations that you're um, wanting to make sure are, are unamended. So. Um, uh, my my question to you, I suppose, then is if you don't believe that uh, a disability can be diagnosed, um, do you have a problem with the way that was drafted uh, in the first place um, by mentioning disability? Um, do you think disability should be mentioned at all within those regulations? Because as I see it at the minute, you can have an abortion up to a certain period, uh, 24 weeks, um, uh, for any reason. But after that, you can only have an abortion if there's a serious disability. And to me, that seems to be discrimination. To me, that seems to be wrong because you're um, uh, making a distinction on whether someone can continue to live based on their uh, disability or not. So I was just wondering how, how you would marry uh, those things. Yeah, um, I think the problem around the term is, as me have very eloquently brought up earlier, is that people have been talking about abortion for disability, but in actual fact, that is not what this is. This is abortion for severe fetal impairment or anomaly, which is completely different. It's often a series of a number of different comorbidities that have been diagnosed um, in the fetus. And I think um, what's really, really important is, yes, it is perfectly reasonable for people to have completely different opinions. And if they find themselves in that situation to want to make their own decision about whether or not to terminate, but it's not okay for those opinions to be directing the choices of someone else who's going through that decision. And that's probably the most important thing that you can absolutely have your own personal um, uh, views about pregnancy and choice, but you kind of given someone else the lack of choice because you think that your opinion is, is worth more than that person's about their own body is the difficulty that we mostly have. Um, one of the real life testimonies that we included in the report um, starts off, for us, the decision to end a much wanted pregnancy was made easier because we were given a, defen a definitive diagnosis. Being exported was the most traumatic part. So this is really key. The key is we are devaluing people who make these decisions and saying that Northern Ireland doesn't want them. We're, we're sending families to England because we literally find it too distasteful to treat them here and that is completely unacceptable and it flies in the face of um, very basic minimum fundamental human rights recommendations. Okay, I suppose then just, um, I don't really feel the questions was answered. Let me see if I can simplify this in, in, in a way. Um, do you think post 24 weeks um, that someone should um, be able to get an abortion because their child has Down syndrome? I think we have also brought this up earlier as well, that it's not as simple as a, a, a straightforward Down syndrome diagnosis. Quite often there's different kinds of Down syndrome. There's uncomplicated Down syndrome, but there's also Down syndrome that is part of a suite of comorbidities and um, congenital heart defects. We have already brought this up and it was quite clear in, in, in Maeve's um, presentation about this. Um, in the countries where abortion is widely available for these reasons, there are still people with Down syndrome who um, live happy and full lives. There, there is no question that people um, will always want to have babies um, with Down syndrome. That is, that is not at question here. What is at question is limiting people's choices when they're given a diagnosis of severe fetal anomaly. Just, just, just to be, to be clear on this, I'm saying post 24 weeks, do Alliance for Choice support um, the right? Um, and do they support that difference to be made that post 24 weeks Down syndrome, if someone comes and, and oh, I guess there are many different types, many, many different ways in which that can impact. But our, our Alliance for Choice saying that there should be that provision made post 24 weeks in a separate way from the rest of the regulations. Um, so that if uh, a baby has Down syndrome, 
that should be reason for abortion. Um, I'm not really sure what part you don't understand, Gordon, but Down syndrome isn't actually listed in the bill, the original bill. It's severe impairment. I'm not really sure what you're trying to get at or what kind of words you're trying to get to come out of my mouth, but I'm not really sure it's that helpful. Just, just asking the question, is Alliance for Choice saying that Down syndrome should be a reason for termination post-24 weeks? Da- Alliance for Choice have made it very clear in our submission, we've made it very clear today from both myself and me that we absolutely support the requirement and the need for healthcare for families who have a severe fetal impairment or anomaly diagnosis with the support of their clinicians and with the support of healthcare professionals who are experts in this field to help them make that decision. Okay, so uh, what I'm taking from that answer is that you don't support, um, you don't support abortion for Down syndrome after after 24 four weeks. Um, I think I think that's positive. Um, just just as was I, I did not say that. I did not say that. I said yeah, the answer, the answer, so, so the answer the answer has been the answer has been the answer has been very clear and put on the record. And witnesses are entitled to have the answers considered in their own words. So very, very brief last question, Gordon, please. Yeah, just just the issue then around uh, coercion. Uh, you, you, you said that coercion doesn't take place, uh, that medical professionals haven't been involved uh, in, in coercion and, and offering uh, uh, abortion for when, whenever disability has been uh, diagnosed. Uh, so um, I suppose can I just ask um, why the lack of trust towards women who have who have who have had that experience and have said that they have been offered or feel pressurized or feel coerced um, into um, getting an abortion, and uh, is that of any concern uh, to you that women are experiencing that this is their um, experience? Gordon, honestly, I mean, medical professionals adhere to GMC regulations. You cannot act in an unprofessional manner and continue to practice medicine. Really, what you're saying is is so deeply insulting to the clinicians, to the experts, to the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. These are the people we should be taking our lead from. These are the people we should be trusting. If in any situation coercion has occurred, those particular medics will be struck off. This will be flagged. You know, these are institutions that have been running for decades, that stringent, um, absolutely stringent professional conduct adhere to at every moment. Are you genuinely have that lack of faith in the medical professionals of Northern Ireland that you would even consider that? Do you have the lack of faith and trust in these women who are saying that these are these are their experiences? One woman in England said she was offered an abortion 15 times. You know, you, you often talk about trusting women. Well, these women are coming forward with their experiences. And I just don't think that we should be dismissive. Okay, can, listen, can, I, can, I also remi- can I also remind can I also remind all members and participants that remarks should come through the chair? Mr. Chairman, look, I think I've, I've made those points anyway. I appreciate the uh, opportunity for the evidence today and, uh, and thank uh, Emma and uh, Mia for the, for the presentation. It's been, it's been insightful. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Gordon. And moving on now to Cara Hunter. Go ahead, Cara, please. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you both to Maeve and Emma for being here this morning. Um, it's been a very detailed briefing, uh, and I've personally found it very helpful, especially around uh, the contributions of lived experience within it. So thank you. I, I will try and be brief. Um, I just have two questions. One thing that the committee has mentioned um, over the past number of weeks is the crucial issue of counselling uh, for mothers, whether they decide um, to keep or, or to seek an abortion. Um, so just to get uh, your assessment of current counselling provision and where you feel it can be improved. And then secondly, um, hypothetically, if this bill was to be implemented, how do you feel that this would impact the appropriate genetic testing um, of fetal remains? Thank you. Before I'll just take your first point. Um, we saw this week that Informing Choices Northern Ireland have uh, produced a, a press release saying that if there's no funding from the Department of Health, uh, the Central Access Point, which has uh, referred thousands of women um, in Northern Ireland to uh, counselling, to non-directive uh, advice, uh, to NHS services, uh, it, it will um, collapse uh, if the Department 
Public Health don't fund this. Um, and that is an integral pathway to counselling. Um, and I think that's indicative of just the difficulties that uh, women who require a pre or post abortion counselling, um, you know, that, that they are experiencing. And uh, there's a warning shot across the bow there um, as to how we need to be prepared uh, to continue these, these facilities uh, and these supports for women and I would really implore yourselves and the health committee to to lobby with the, the Department of Health uh, to provide um, funding for the very important central access point. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank, and just, thank you, Chair. Is that, uh, yeah. Just, just that we say a bit there on the appropriate night testing of fetal remains, if, if anybody has any contributions on that, I find that very helpful. Yeah, there's already been an issue with that for um, families in Northern Ireland where remains are having to be sent to Alderhay in Liverpool. Um, and I think we need to really think about what the wraparound services um, really are and what we require whenever we um, make, when we hopefully finally make the Commission for Abortion Services in Northern Ireland. Um, not only that, but there's a number of various tests that um, people in, uh, so whenever I'm I um, moved back to Northern Ireland. I suddenly lost the ability during my pregnancy to have a number of different tests. And I think we need really need to address that for the um, health and well-being of women and pregnant people in Northern Ireland. Absolutely. We had mentioned uh, previously over the past number of weeks about the, the kind of financial, socioeconomic barriers to Iona tests and things like that. So I just want to thank you both. This has been a very informative session for myself. So thank you for your contributions today. Thank, thank you, Chara and Arlia. Orlea Flynn, please go ahead, Orlea. Uh, Gormi Ogut, Chair, and thanks to Emma and Maeve. I know that we've went over time, so I am just going to be, um, I'll be quick here. I just wanted to make a couple of points. Um, Emma, I think it was you had touched on earlier in your remarks around, um, you know, so as opposed to looking at, you know, the different aspects of, of this bill, how you can try and improve services for women at all those different stages throughout um, throughout pregnancy. And that lack of information um, is something that has come up um, during a couple of sessions at Health Committee. So I think Carl touched on it earlier whenever we heard from the fetal doctors last week um, that the issue around that clinic in particular, that's it, it, to me, it's almost false advertising. Um, the fact that it's advertising to provide a service and then, you know, obviously the trauma that women are then going through, um, you know, throughout that process and, you know, all that delay and uncertainty and, and, and all the rest. So it was just to make both yourself and Maeve um, aware that the committee did agree last week to write off to the minister around a couple of things. So it was around the protests at the clinics, obviously calling that out. Um, it was also then around uh, the issue that had come up around that lack of information, you know, about like what services are available. And um, so people, you know, aren't being, you know, who'd went into a certain service that, that isn't, you know, practical and it isn't what they need. And then the final issue was around that, um, around the abortion reversal pills. So there was a bit of conversation around that last week too. So once we get any correspondence back, obviously, you know, we will let you know what the, what the minister, um, has said. And then it was just another issue had come up around, uh, the, you know, the access to, um, psychological services, you know, from the NHS and, you know, when women are, you know, all those different stages of pregnancy. One of the doctors was saying last week that, you know, those services are really, really, really stretched, that there's long waiting lists and that at times when women are in really difficult positions and having to make really, really complex and difficult choices about their lives and their future and, you know, the possible future of a possible child and all the rest, um, that at times they're actually not um, always getting that psychological support, you know, from the NHS. So again, just FYI, that's something that we're raising with, that I'm going to go back and raise with the, the minister directly. Um, but, but I have to say, for me, what I'm taking out of today's conversation and what I've took out of the, the briefing that both of you have provided to the, the committee today. Um, and I know we've talked about a number of different things and there's a no number of different viewpoints and perspectives and all the rest. And, and that is fair enough. But I think, Maeve, it was, it was a remark that you had made in terms of the bill. Okay. Because obviously that's what we're here to talk about. And you had referenced, Maeve, that, you know, if, if this bill progresses and passes, um, that it's targeting an extremely, extremely small number 
of vulnerable families and women with wanted pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So that are then possibly being forced into a scenario where they have to make decisions around terminations, you know, at different time scales or, you know, within that, that small, that small um, period of time. And I have to just say, that's what I've took away from today. So Absolutely. thank you for your patience. And I think if all of us can go away thinking of one thing, it's of that very extremely small number of um, vulnerable families that are going through, I'm sure, just complete distress. So I just want to say thanks very much. Thank you. And I'll just say, you know, I talk about the four week window. That's that's maximum. You know, that's four weeks from day of of, of diagnosis to, you know, you've run out of time. Um, you know, that's and look at the, the waiting list. Look at the you know, we're in a pandemic at the minute. You know, there's there's so many different, um, you know, impediments to getting all the information to, un to, to unpack and what you've been told four weeks to make such a huge decision. It's just, it's plainly cruel. It's unnecessary. And it, this bill should not go through. Yeah. Thanks for your uh, comments. And we really appreciate that. That's what you're taking away. And we really appreciate the, the work that you are doing in terms of letters about the information and so on. So. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Emma and Maeve. I would like to very much thank you for coming to committee this morning, for providing your evidence in written format prior to that, and for taking and addressing questions from members. And I want to wish you all the very best in the time ahead. Thank you. Okay, members. So I am advised. I am advised by the clerk that we do have our next uh, member, next witnesses online, and that we can move straight to the our second substantial brief, briefing. Uh, and this briefing is also in relation to severe fetal impairment abortion amendment bill. We are today in this briefing getting uh, receiving information from Doctors for Choice, Abortion Rights Campaign, and the Women's Policy Group NA. Uh, I refer members there to the written submissions received at tab 6.1 to tab 6.3 of your pack. Um, so the members who we have attending today are Dr. Alison Hunter, who is a consultant obstetrician with Doctors for Choice. Um, can you hear me, Dr. Hunter? Yes, thank you, Colm. Yeah, um, thank you. We also are joined. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Alison? Yes, I can. Thank you. Can, okay, can thank you, you. Yeah, we're hearing you. It's a little faint, Alison, so if you can increase the volume, that's no harm, but mm -hmm. I can hear you okay. Okay, we also have Miss Helen Stonehouse, who is co-convener with Abortion Rights Campaign. Can you hear me, Helen, okay? Yes, I can, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, hearing you fine there, Helen, thank you. And Miss Danielle Roberts, who is Policy Officer with the Women's Policy Group. Are you hearing us okay, Danielle? Yes, sir. Um, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you there, Danielle. So listen, thank you all for attending and for providing committee with your evidence this morning. I will go back to you, Dr. Hunter, in the first instance to see, um, and I would ask each of you to do a brief uh, presentation, and we will then move to questions from members. Uh, so, uh, Alison, could you go ahead and maybe start off with your presentation, please? <clears throat> yes, I hope you can hear me. If you need me to talk louder, just let me know. So Doctors for Choice is, um, as you'll see from your briefing, a group of doctors, not including only obstetricians. And I'm, I'm also a consultant in fetal medicine in the Belfast Trust, but it's obstetricians, gynecologists, GPs, anaesthetists. It's a mixed bunch. We all have the um, opinion that women should have the highest quality of sexual and reproductive health care um, in Northern Ireland. And that should start with good sex education easily available contraception for all, and if required, high, por high quality abortion services. But our, our main word is choice. We um, believe that women must have choice. Autonomy, as said before from Alliance, regarding their own bodies and their health. And my personal opinion and the opinions of the doctors in our group is that we are here as doctors, we're here to help women and families, and we're not here to judge them. We want to help them. Um, I'm a fetal medicine consultant, and I know you got a very thorough briefing last week from uh, Carolyn Bailey and John Manderson, and I'll try not to go over any of the points they went through, but um, 
it's a very long training. There's an emotive, um, it's an emotive area. It's not a popular area to go into, as you can imagine. There's a lot of ethical issues and a high burnout rate, and we have to train longer. And um, it has been particularly difficult practicing in Northern Ireland in the last, I would say, sort of 10 to 12 years and fetal medicine. Um, abortion is part, but not the main part of our work in fetal medicine. Um, we look after people with multiple pregnancies, other abnormalities, growth, prematurity issues and other complex maternal illness in pregnancy. But fetal abnormality and abortion and off, being able to offer women abortion is a very important part of our work. And we want to be able to give women choice because it's been incredibly difficult not to offer women with a diagnosis of a fetal abnormality um, um, a, this, this option. And I really think I would just like to try and give you an example of what it would be like for um, me seeing a woman who's got a severe abnormality. When we see her, we scan her in a room. We go through all the findings with her. We take over to what I call a little pink sitting room. And some of the women over the years who will have, man have written to the health committee will have had to face myself or one of the other consultants as we give them what can be a really life. It'll be a life changing um, moment for them because we are talking particularly with regard to this bill with fatal or extremely serious not for example after 24 weeks the diagnosis of uncomplicated down syndrome a very severe abnormality that's massively going to affect the child it's going to affect the woman it's going to affect her relationship with her husband with her or partner with her family so the women are often brought to this room and as you can imagine, tears are flowing. And over the years, we've had to, you know, some of the women will say to us, well, this is so bad. I don't want to carry on with this pregnancy. Even at this early stage, they might say, I just can't see myself for whatever reason going on. And when we tell them or we have told them in the past that they cannot carry on with this pregnancy, can you imagine how horrendous that is? Um, and the, 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 the grief that is added to by this uh, this lack of choice over the years has just been horrendous and has really, really made the guilt that is put on top of women, because women feel guilty anyway. The first thing we try and say to them is, this is not your fault, because women will say, this be lab abnormalities, it's my fault. It's something with me, it's something I've done, which it very often isn't, but they feel such guilt. And then to absolutely make that guilt so much worse by saying, and by the way, in Northern Ireland, you cannot access abortion for this, you must carry on with the pregnancy or you'll have to travel. Okay. It's, it's, it's just quite horrendously awful. And not only do we have the, the sadness, but we also have the anger. And that anger is very often felt by their partners who think that their the, this poor woman is going to have to carry on with the pregnancy, how it's going to affect their life. So let me give you some examples. In the last couple of years, just the last couple of cases I could think, for example, um, one woman, she had two children with really severe autism. Both her and her husband had had to give up their work to look after these two children. Um, she got pregnant unexpectedly at age 41 <clears throat> and was diagnosed um, with abnormalities on her ultrasound scan at 20 weeks. I saw her about 10 days later, carried out an amniocentesis and the child had Down syndrome. When I called her with the result, all I could hear was the screaming in the background, the constant sound that she heard from her daughter with autism that she had to live with day in and day out. Um, she, of course, was absolutely devastated. Both her and her partner were saying when they found out about the pregnancy, they were so excited, they were so hopeful that this child might be well because this child might actually look after their other children when something when they passed away so you can imagine how devastated they were to find out this diagnosis and can you imagine how even more devastated they were when they were told that they were not allowed an abortion in northern ireland because she did not meet the criteria this woman could not carry on with this pregnancy because of the terrible burden she already had with her children at home she had to travel to england alone while her husband looked after the children at home. It was extremely difficult for her. And um, she told me that when she was there, she thought of taking her own life. And after she came back through her GP, we had to arrange for her to have um, a lot of counselling um, because she did not want to have an abortion, but she just could not go ahead. So these are the kind of things when people say they're anti-abortion, 
Every woman is an individual. All of us have our own problems, our own circumstances. But to have a, di a diagnosis of a life limiting or um, a fatal abnormality has huge implications for very, very many people. And abortion is probably going to be their only option. For us in Northern Ireland to wash your hands off these people and say, no, we cannot do this here. It's just wrong. We know from human rights perspective, from a legal perspective, it's wrong. And let me tell you, as a doctor that looks after these women, it is totally and utterly wrong. This woman should have been looked after. I should have looked after her in the hospital. I should have been able to care for her going through abortion and afterwards. It was absolutely devastating for her. And I felt so bad as a doctor having to do that. And I could go through other ones and a first lady, uh, another lady who had a child, her first baby died in utero at 26 Just briefly, weeks. please, sorry. Alison. Sorry. Very, very briefly, please, Alison. Contact we're we're pressed for time. Sorry. And again, forced to go to England when her second child had a serious brain abnormality and would have had no quality of life after counselling and diagnosis that MRI after 24 weeks, she went to England. So people change their mind when this happens to them. I've had people come to me saying they would never consider an abortion, but when they go home, when they think about it, they consider that they could not go ahead with it. And vice versa, other people think they wouldn't have a baby with an abnormality when it happens to them. They can't go ahead. So let us try and give some empathy and some sympathy to these women. People will get an abortion if we refuse it. They will travel or they will perform illegally. Some of these women that cannot travel because um, of restrictions such as COVID, who knows what's in future, other children, home issues, illness, their own illness, they're too unwell to travel during pregnancy or refugee status. These women will find a way to have an abortion and that may be buying pills over the internet, having very unsafe abortions at home because we're talking, these pills are safe early in pregnancy, but later, 20, 24 weeks plus, they can be very, very serious indeed. So all I ask on behalf of Doctors for Choice and for the women that I look after and their families is please, can you as MLAs, please refuse to pass this bill um, and, um, and show your sympathy with each woman as she goes through this terrible time in her life. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alison. Um, and going then to Helen. Helen, you go ahead with your presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you all for having me here today. I'm from the Abortion Rights Campaign. Uh, so we campaign primarily in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and I want to speak to the experiences of the Republic of Ireland today. So it's nearly three years since abortion was legalized in certain circumstances in the Republic of Ireland under Section 11 of our Health Regulation of Termination of Pregnancy Act. Abortion is permitted for a fetal diagnosis that is likely to lead to the death of the fetus either before or within 28 days of birth which means that our current abortion legislation um, is therefore very similar to what's being proposed under the severe fetal impairment bill um, in that abortion for fetal indication is only permitted where it's considered uh, fatal. And so before this legislation was passed, activists and doctors repeatedly emphasized that this overly prescriptive legislation, which restricts access in this way, would force discussions around fetal anomalies into this binary situation, which doesn't reflect the complex reality of risk and probability that's involved in such pregnancies, as Alison was already saying. And then this has been reflected in the experiences of those facing complex fetal diagnoses in Ireland. So in 2019, 100 people access abortion in the Republic of Ireland in the case of fatal abnormality, under Section 11. However, according to NHS statistics, 63 residents of the Republic travelled um, to England and Wales to access abortion underground E uh, in 2019. And in 2020, a further 64 people travelled to England for abortion underground E. So that means that for every three people who are obtaining an abortion for fetal indication in Ireland, two are still forced to travel to England. And we know that an unknown number may have gone to other countries. And, and in many cases, uh, these these are fetuses where there was only a very limited chance of survival, yet they were still denied care in their own jurisdiction. So a group called Termination for Medical Reasons support people who receive complex prenatal diagnoses. Uh, and they stated that of those who came to them for support in 2020, 85% of them had to travel to England after being informed that their condition was not fatal enough. Uh, one of the women supported by TFMR explained the severity of this condition, which was considered not fatal enough. Cloacal extrophy, apologies for pronunciation, is what our baby had, which means that all organs were outside of the body, stomach, liver, spleen, intestines, bladder split in two and connected to the colon, no anus, no phallus or reproductive organs, and spine split in two. We were told that there was little hope that he would survive a birth, but that if he did, he might survive longer than 28 days. And therefore we were told, you have options in the UK, but our hands are tied here. Um, 
the inability of medical professionals to provide care due to the restrictive legislation causes, as I'm sure you can imagine, significant distress to patients and to providers. Uh, parents talk about being told that they have to travel because their condition is not fatal enough, because it doesn't tick the correct legal boxes. Doctors have stated there are certain pregnancies that should have the option of termination of pregnancy that our legislation can't facilitate. There's a whole proportion of ostracized anomalies now that are not fatal, but that are still really not okay. Um, and because doctors face criminal penalties for provision outside of the legislation, they are very overly cautious in their interpretation. Um, and so if someone has, if there is the odd instance of a fetus having survived or baby having survived more than 28 days, then doctors are being told that they shouldn't be do this at risk of criminal prosecution. So this chilling effect is really essential and you really can't underestimate it. And in some cases, this lack of clarity over what is and isn't legal means that care can be refused in one hospital, but available in another. One woman explained that her experience was extremely traumatic. I had a scan in court, diagnosed possible thanatophoric dysplasia. The consultant said, no consultant in the country will touch you. We left thinking we would have to travel to the UK in a panic. I was already 21 weeks. We made calls and had consultations in UK clinics. No one would take us due to the pandemic. We had to get COVID tests to fly. I made a will to take care of my other daughter in case I died because of a possibility of complications as well as the possibility of getting COVID. One abortion clinic in the UK refused to take me in case of rupture with an anterior placenta. Thankfully, this woman was actually referred to a different hospital um, in Limerick and was able to actually get the care she needed because it was legally available. But that complication as to whether or not that clarity of what it meant, meant that she was put through a significant amount of trauma and had to travel halfway through the country. And as she said, made all these additional plans. And again, as I know that um, has already been covered by Alliance for Choice, the need of traveling for abortion care perpetuates that stigma and harm at an already really difficult time. So the trauma of ending a wanted pregnancy is complicated by difficulties in arranging funerals and the repatriation of remains. One woman said, we never got to bring our baby home, not even as ashes. It haunts me to this day and forever will that we had to leave our baby behind. So this bill would place uh, medical professions in Northern Ireland in a very similar situation to which they are in the Republic of Ireland, where diagnosing fetal anom which anomalies are eligible for abortion is a question of trying to interpret the law rather than trying to interpret the medical science. Um, uh, and that means that they have to focus on that interpretation of law rather than focusing on providing the care and information to their parents. Research from 2017 shows that the legal context in which a diagnosis occurs has a significant impact on the nature of the clinical advice and care given, which in turn affects the rights and choices available to a pregnant person at a vulnerable time. Basically, if doctors are overly focused on whether or not something is permissible, it will change the advice they give because they are constrained by the context, not because doctors are necessarily trying to pressure people one way or another, but because they are concerned with that legal issue. Um, and as I'm sure we can all agree, it's essential that people receiving a prenatal diagnosis are given evidence-based and unbiased information and support about what continuing or ending a pregnancy might mean for their individual situation. Um, and briefly, from a human rights perspective, there is no human rights compliant way to restrict abortion to only fatal fetal diagnoses due to the difficulties in defining what fatal means and the impact of that difficulty on diagnostic processes. The Republic of Ireland has been repeatedly criticised by international human rights bodies for failing to provide abortion care, including in cases of prenatal diagnosis. In the cases of Amanda Mellon and Siobhan Whelan, taken to the New United Nations Human Rights Committee, Ireland was found to have subjected these women to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, to discrimination and to an arbitrary interference with their right to privacy by forcing them to travel overseas for abortion care. Um, and again, these cases demonstrate that permitting travel to another jurisdiction is not sufficient to meet the human rights obligations, which have led to the introduction of abortion legislation in Northern Ireland. It is also worth noting that there are still cases in the Republic of Ireland of people traveling after a diagnosis of holoprosencephaly, which is the same diagnosis that Ms. Whelan received under our legislation, which permits care only for fatal abnormalities. To give one more example, in December 2020, despite being told that their baby was unlikely to survive birth and that any short time he did survive would be spent struggling to breathe, a young couple from Dublin were unable to access a compassionate induction of labour to end the pregnancy. Despite that diagnosis of holoproskin carefully, the same as Ms. Whelan, they were told that isn't something we facilitate here and had to travel abroad. They organised flights, accommodation, COVID tests, hospital care and a funeral for their baby, all while worrying that London might go into lockdown before they could bring him home. Their story and far too many others are the legacy of Ireland's restrictive abortion, le abortion legislation. And this proposed bill would lead to more heartbreaking stories in Northern Ireland of those facing complex pregnancies who are forced to travel in violation of human rights and decency. And finally, I would like to emphasize that restrictions on reproductive rights do not improve the rights of disabled people. 
restrictions on abortion reduce the re reproductive rights and freedoms of disabled people who often face additional barriers in accessing abortion care, particularly if they're forced to travel. And in a joint statement, CEDAW and the CRPD said access to safe and legal abortion, as well as related services and information, are essential aspects of women's reproductive health and a prerequisite for guarding their human rights. They argue that states should adopt effective measures to enable women, including women with disabilities, to make autonomous decisions about their sexual and reproductive health. And in order to respect the autonomy of all pregnant people, including disabled people, we would argue that it's imperative that this bill is not brought into law. No one should have to continue a pregnancy against their will or travel for health care to another jurisdiction that should be provided at home. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Helen. And we will go then for a final presentation to Danielle. Go ahead, Danielle, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am here today as a representative of the Women's Policy Group and one of the co-authors of the collective evidence submission um, made by Women's Policy Group, which is uh, a group of uh, women working in policy and advocacy roles in different organisations. The Women's Policy Group wholly disagrees with the bill in question as it violates the human rights of women, girls and pregnant people. This is highlighted comprehensively throughout our evidence submission and I would particularly draw the attention of the committee to section 6 which contains personal testimonies. This bill would lead the women and pregnant people being rushed to terminate pregnancies before 24 weeks, which removes the time needed for diagnosis, diagnostic tests and specialist advice often needed or being forced to join the 10 a week who already travelled to England to access abortion care there. The Women's Policy Group is gravely concerned with how this bill disregards the existing medical evidence on the matter and how this bill would increase the legal and political scrutiny on abortions for fetal impairment. This would have an extremely negative impact on both the ability of medical professionals to do their job while also limiting the support provided to families dealing with the diagnosis of severe fetal impairment. If severe fetal impairment is removed as a permitted reason for abortion, Medical professionals in Northern Ireland will be operating in a climate where they risk criminalisation as they decide whether a condition satisfies the fatal requirement rather than being severe. The committee has already received presentations on the human rights incompatibility of the bill, as well as the various paper accompanying this bill outlining the human rights implications. The Women's Policy Group would particularly highlight the CEDAW recommendation now incorporated into primary legislation that there be provision um, adopted in legislation for expanded ground for abortion access in three areas, which includes severe fetal impairment, including fetal fetal abnormality, without perpetuating stereotypes towards persons with disabilities, and ensuring appropriate and ongoing support, social and financial, for women who decide to carry such pregnancies to term. That's the law that we should have in place now. It is essential to note that the Committee on the UN Convention of uh, the Rights of People with Disabilities, along with the CEDAW Committee, has emphasised that using disability rights as an argument to oppose safe abortion is a misinterpretation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Specifically, states two parties should fulfil their obligations under Article 5 and 8 of CEDA and CRPD respectively by addressing the root causes of discrimination against women and persons with disabilities. This includes challenging discriminatory attitudes and fostering respect for the rights and dignity of persons with disabilities in particular women with disabilities, as well as providing support to parents of children with disabilities in this regard. Health policies and abortion laws that perpetuate deep-rooted stereotypes and stigma undermine women's reproductive autonomy and choice, and they should be repealed because they are discriminatory. The Women's Policy Group has advocated for many actions to be taken by the executive to advance the rights of disabled women and disabled people more generally. We would suggest that the committee focuses instead on the impact of welfare reform and austerity on the health and well-being of the old people in Northern Ireland, rather than further restricting the rights of women which have yet to be implemented or made accessible. We need to reform how society treats disability in order to support families with disabled children, rather than focusing on pervasive medical models and austerity that makes it extremely difficult to support disabled children. Restricting abortions for severe fetal impairment would negatively impact disabled women. Disabled women are also autonomous people who have access to reproductive health care and face greater barriers than non disabled women in accessing it. The Women's Policy Group hopes that this bill does not proceed for all the reasons outlined in our written evidence submission. Abortion has been decriminalised in Northern Ireland, yet the abortion framework and regulations have still not been commissioned. Despite this, more work has been done publicly in the Northern Ireland Assembly to further restrict abortion access that has not yet been made freely available. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so just uh, just one question from me and then I'll go to members. Uh, at this stage, I have indications from Cara, Jerry and Paula. Um, just going back to, to one of the points that you made there in the early part of your uh, presentation, Danielle, you said that this bill ignores existing med medical evidence on this matter. Could you elaborate a little on what you mean by that? Alison might be might be better than me, but um, I think yeah. she expanded it in the in the written submission um, that there isn't a clear cut definition of what severe fetal impairment and what fetal fetal impairment is, and um, if you restrict to fetal fetal abnormality, the examples like Helen said are exactly what's going to happen in Northern Ireland, um, where, where there isn't you know medical best practice is is where we should be looking, not not working in legislation. Okay, thank you. And Alison, do you want to make a, a contribution to that answer? Can you hear me? Um, Not yeah. hearing you, Alison. Can you hear yeah, me now? I hear you now, yeah. Yes, I mean, I yeah. think, again, and this has been a real issue in the South, uh, Danielle um, has also alluded to this, and that the South of Ireland, you make this very distinct determination between fatal and severely severe impairment severe abnormality it's very very difficult and i think um, um we find that very very difficult i think sometimes we could have a condition for example trisomy 18 which is a is a ultimately lethal abnormality some fetuses will die in utero there have been some cases where the the child has survived to the age of two the majority will die shortly after birth so i think if you say fatal it is very narrowing and i think what we should be thinking in terms of really um, severe disability, severe, severe disability or limited life. And that is, you know, again, I think going back to Gordon's point earlier on, he was talking about, you know, would you would you terminate it or do you agree with termination of Down syndrome after 24 weeks? It's, it's, it is clear within the guidance that we have within um, our COG and our Fetal Medicine Foundation that it has to be a, a termination after 24 weeks must have a very severe disability, a life or a lim life limiting consequence. So Down syndrome per se would not meet that criteria. Um, an MDT, if it was a Down syndrome with no abnormality, would not meet the criteria. However, um, you can have a baby with Down syndrome have a very very severe brain abnormality, a lethal or potentially life limiting cardiac condition. So. Um, you know, I think each case can be very complicated. Each case can be very individual. We 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 want to think very much both in our terms as health professionals um, to give as much information for these women as possible. So I think you're absolutely right to um, try and have a bill that tries to extremely limit women's choices is actually quite uh, is is a detrimental thing, and it doesn't give women putting a. a a strict time limit before finding out as much information as possible. Uh, it, it's not helpful um, and it, it's extremely unfair, I think. Um, the second case I was going to mention there, the woman was after 24 weeks and she had had an MRI of the brain. It was going to be a severely life limiting stroke fatal abnormality. Again, there was nothing we could do for that woman. She had to go to England to terminate her pregnancy. Again, it was very suicidal in her time there. You know, so these are the types of things, and I think we need to have trust. I, I want to express to the MLAs, it upsets me when I hear some of the things that are being said this morning, when people like myself, we have put our lives really into trying to deliver a high quality care for women that are at a terrible period in their lives. It, this lack of trust that is apparent from some MLAs in the medical profession I think is um, is really quite abhorrent, actually, and I <laughs> I find it hard not to take it personally. So it's not about my per about me personally. It is about women. But if you're attacking us, you're attacking the women and their choice and their lives. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go then to members' questions, and if I could ask all members and and panel. To be conscious, we are dealing with very sensitive and very complex issues here with issues that have faced people in their real lives and continue to face people in their real lives. And I think we should reflect that in how we engage in this 
uh, evidence session today. So I'd ask all members also to be conscious of time. I want to be fair to all members and to give members equal amount of time within the, the bounds of the time limits of the session. And uh, just in general, that all, all remarks, uh, both questions and, and responses should be directed through the chair. And uh, I, I appreciate members and panels um, adherence to to uh, that sensitivity. Um, so I'll go then first of all to Chiara Hunter. Chiara, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and I am mindful of time, so I will try and be brief. Um, just to thank the panel here this morning for being here, Alison, Helen and Danielle, thank you for your contributions. Um, my question today is for Alison, and it's just regarding, um, hypothetically, if this bill was to pass and a woman presents themselves after the 24-week mark um, and the fetus does have a severe fetal impairment, how would this bill change what advice and support that you can give and um, what would that look like? That's what I'm trying to grasp. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cara. So if, if it becomes um, impossible to offer a woman termination after 24 weeks, um, again, we can try and find out as much as we can for this woman in Northern Ireland at, this, at that time. Um, we can try and um, still convene our MDT, try and get information for her, because that is what we do with these complex abnormalities. We do have MDTs where we discuss with people like fetal cardiologists, paediatricians, neonatologists, um, a whole range of people, geneticists. Um, can we get as much information as this woman, for this woman as possible? Now, if abortion was not possible, then for the woman here in Northern Ireland, and she wished to proceed with that, because again, many women will decide to carry on with the pregnancy, and we can look after those women. But for the women that we couldn't look after, the only option for her then would be to travel again to um, Great Britain, to the mainland, and mainland Great Britain, and to um, seek a termination there, which again, for all the reasons I've said before, I think is, is the wrong thing. And uh, I know you've had a lot of reasons from other fetal medicine consultants and others about why that would be particularly different, difficult for the woman. And again, um, each individual woman may find travel very, very difficult for her. For some women, they may not be able to travel. Um, they might be unwell themselves, for, for example. Again, some of these women will actually develop obstetric complications from some of the severe fetal abnormalities, for example, severe early onset preeclampsias, where they could um, have seizures and die. We couldn't actually send those women away. Um, and again, these things are rare things. Um, the thought of later termination isn't self rare, but you know, they are a reality. So what are we going to do with a woman in that situation? What, what, will we, what will we be able to do to help her? She'll probably have to carry on until you know, the preeclampsia becomes so severe that um, she would need to be delivered. But at that stage, the child possibly may survive for a while um, and the woman will have to go through that on her family. And it may be that she may have severe problems uh, coping with that when her choice would have been a termination. So I think I think that is what we're looking at. Either she will be forced to travel or she if she wishes to go ahead with an abortion, if she cannot travel, she will be forced to carry on with the pregnancy that she doesn't want to go on with. So in either way, it's not, a, it's not a good situation for the woman to be in. Okay, thank you, Alison. That was a very detailed answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And going then to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, Lana Eilish and Kest, Lida Hall. Come uh, Thanks, panel. Uh, two questions. Uh, they might both be for Alison, so <laughs> apologies to the other panellists. Um, Alison, you kind of touched upon it there about, you know, um, maybe taking... Uh, have you said uh, opposition uh, to the work that you and others carry out? Uh, it's hard to not take it personally, and I, I, I don't uh, doubt that, that that's a reality for you. Um, I mean, what would you say to the uh, presumption, uh, the misinformation that uh, abortion is essentially uh, forced uh, and women are pressured uh, into uh, making a decision or a termination? Uh, in regards to, um, you know, generally speaking, but in, re in regards to regulations as they exist uh, at the minute, and also maybe specifically around maybe tackling the um, uh, disinformation, uh, the untruth that uh, women are, are pressured to have termination in regards to solely a, a cleft palate or, or club foot uh, diagnosis and how would that make you feel? And just my final question, um, 
you know, maybe more of a general question, but I suppose connected to this bill is, I mean, how is, is people here, uh, doctors and people here medical um, in the medical field, I mean, how does it make it feel that women can't get access to uh, services in their hospitals uh, with their GPs here uh, in terms of telemedicine and other issues? Uh, and the fact that abortion is essentially a form of healthcare across the world, but it's treated as, as something obviously very, very different. I mean, as medical uh, practitioners and, and people obviously invested uh, in uh, in medicine um, practice, how, how would that make you feel? Those are my questions, and, and thanks for um, presenting this morning. Um, thank you, Jerry. Well, at the end of the day, um, and I think MLAs and politicians will know better than anybody, there's many ways when you say something that people will maybe misconstrue what you're saying. So from the point earlier on, women may report a conversation with um, counselling that they were forced, and that's their perception. That's their right to have that perception. However, if a doctor, if the woman was um, concerned enough that she wanted to launch an investigation, then she should have the right to be able to launch that investigation against that health professional, and then we should be able to find evidence. If there was evidence that uh, uh, a clinician forced their opinion or was trying to force abortion, then they would be in very serious trouble because we have um, standards that we have to adhere to. And that is not to put our own personal preferences onto the healthcare that we provide to people. So, um, so again, that is unfortunate, but I understand that happens. You know, it's happened, I think, to all of us. You know, people have taken things the wrong way when we have said them, but, um, you know, so there is, there is, protection for the public from that point of view so abortion should not be forced on anybody um, and again I would even though I believe in them um, it is a woman's right absolutely to say that's not what I want um, I think um, again just to go back to your point I mean I again I find as an obstetrician you go into the practice it's babies it's delivery um, my experiences over the years led me into fetal medicine just with some of the things that I saw and it probably changed my views on abortion over the years um, and I appreciate that many people um, have very fixed views on abortion and that is their right that is their right to have that view and I can understand why it's a very ethically difficult area for some people however with what I've seen over the years um, not just in terms of fetal abnormality but an unwanted pregnancy or a pregnancy a woman feels she cannot continue with. I, I totally um, believe in the rights to abortion at any, you know, at earlier gestations as well. I think telemedicine in early pregnancy before 10 to 12 weeks and the delivery of abortion pills at home has been shown. I mean, I was wary about that in the past, but evidence, medical evidence has come through to show that that is safe. So I think that should be available to women. I mean, again, um, this is never an easy decision for women. And I think things that went, the more private, the more um, respectful it is for women, I think the better as well, as long as it's safe. And I think doctors for choice, our keyword is choice, but also safety. And I think safety is what we want to provide. And um, so I think it's been very difficult, I think for an awful lot of um, healthcare professionals, not just doctors, but people working across the province, because it, it is a postcode lottery. There are some places where it's been impossible, really, to um, provide abortion. And it's extremely hard for women when, because we talk about travel to mainland, but if you're from Derry and you're traveling to Belfast and you're away from your family, that's hard too, you know? So I think, I th I think um, women should be given the choice. And I mean, again, I think to go back to one of your points, I mean, again, I think we would ask that our politicians that they will trust us in the medical profession, that we we do have to adhere to very, very strict guidance about the way we um, we way we act. And it's become much stricter as the years have gone on. Um, and while we respect other people's views, we would ask you also to respect what we do in trying to help women at these very difficult times. I hope that's answered. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank okay, you. Jerry. Okay, Thank you. And going to Paula Bradshaw then. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, ladies, for your presentation this morning. Um, Helen, I'm just going to address your comments there at the start. Um, 
Thank you very much for taking an interest and showing up today um, because you've provided us with um, the reality, a, a sense of clarity of what it's like for, for women to bounce between hospitals in a state of emotional stress. And I have to say, I was very choked up when you said there, it haunts me to this day that I had to leave my baby behind. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, uh, can I move then on to um, Alison, um, just to pick that point up. So a, a, a lady or a couple leave your um, consultancy room and you said you can't help them. So they leave your room. What happens to them next? Do they then have to do what Helen has indicated there, phone round hospitals in England and find out and make their own travel arrangements? And, you know, how do they navigate the system whenever you can provide the support you want? That's my first question. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, until the last couple of years, there was actually so much fear following the 2013 letter from the Attorney General that actually that's exactly what we were told to do. We were advised not even to give women advice. Um, we were, if they asked about abortion, we were saying we cannot provide it. End of story. Um, because if we, because in, in that original letter, it was if we um, procure, so you give advice about how to achieve an abortion, you could also, we could also have um, 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 been prosecuted. That was one of the things. So that was extremely difficult. Ex I mean, it was just horrendous. The last couple of years then when um, the government brought in um, that we could give women money to seek uh, terminations across the water, we were able to direct them towards the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. If a woman um, has a particularly difficult case, for example, um, to have an abortion, she may rupture her uterus, she may have a severe haemorrhage, bleed, very, very difficult delivery, then we could phone um, some of the units, the mainland NHS units. But again, it's a, very, it's a very difficult time for the women. There is a lot that will be left for them to do. We try and help as much as we can, but um, a lot of the travel arrangements and where they stay and those, you know, things you don't want to have to do when you're, you're um, with this type of um, diagnosis. But I think what really we are scared about, Paula, is that if we go back to those days around the 2013s, that um, I, I don't know whether I could go back to those days um, um, because it was just so, so difficult to work in and there was a lot of fear. Um, and I find it extremely difficult to do my job in an empathetic, kind way. And um, we have, we've just, we have real trouble getting people. We've just lost a doctor we trained up here in fetal medicine. She, we have, we have to spend part of our training in the mainland and she just decided to go to the mainland because it was going to be more, more holistic care that she could give. And we have just appointed a doctor who's worked in England to come back to work in fetal medicine, who's worked in um, England. However, she is looking at what's going on and saying, will I stay in this job if I have to work within these confines? So, and again, I mentioned earlier on, fetal medicine, it's not just about abortion abnormality. It's about multiple pregnancies. It's about difficult pregnancies. It's about growth problems, prematurity, correct time of delivery. Where do we deliver babies with specific problems? Um, you know, there's a lot to it. And we look after people with severe medical conditions who then become pregnant. So if we don't get this right in Northern Ireland, we're going to lose fetal maternal care in Northern Ireland. You know, so it does. It's 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 a big issue. You know, it's a big issue. We don't want to go back. And Carolyn and um, John Manderson mentioned last week, the lack of clarity is very difficult for ourselves in helping women. It's very difficult for us if, we, if it's if it's um, if it becomes very confined um, and also, if we feel fear, then we won't do our job properly. Thank you, Alison. Um, and my second and last question, Chair, is to Danielle, and, and to thank her for the, the submission on behalf of the women's sector. And I suppose it's, it's a, maybe a very general question, but you know, what message um, does this bill send out? And if it was passed by the Northern Ireland Assembly, what, they, what would the people that you represent here today send, feel that this um, says to them as women in terms of being, being able to make choices over their own reproductive health care. Thank you. Um, well, it removes choice. Um, so we're talking about quite often 
people who are a good way through a very much wanted pregnancy. Um, the the amount the, the majority of abortions happen before ten weeks. Ninety five percent plus happen before ten weeks. So we're not talking about big numbers, but um, we're talking about big impact. Um, termination for medical reasons have been mentioned. They also support people in Northern Ireland, and um, there's been some very high profile cases of women who've been forced to travel. Um, so Sarah Yurt and Ashley Hoffley and Vinny Sillen um, have all been, been kind of obliged to, to share their deeply personal and traumatic experiences in order to try and bring about change. Um, the testimonies that have been collected by Women's Policy Group, as well as Alliance of Choice, um, who just gave a brief note to me earlier. So people have been through very horrendous things, being forced to travel, as Alison has highlighted, um, because they can't get care here, away from their support systems, away from, um, away from their family, away from their medical team. Um, so it just sends a message that we're, we're just going to adopt NIMBYism and it's fine to pack you off to England, but we don't want you doing it here. Um, because that's the reality, people will continue to travel to England. There's funded, funded care in England um, and, and it's legal. So people will continue to travel. So it's basically just saying, oh, we don't want to, I decide out of mind. Your, your trauma is not, um, is not something that we want to bother ourselves with. Um, instead of providing support for people who, who need to access a termination for medical reasons. Um, but there's also some of the way that debates have happened around, um, around this bill. Um, there's been quite a lot of kind of playing um, people who are disabled against people who need abortions. And these aren't separate groups. Disabled people need access to abortion care as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of the, this kind of um, paternalism towards disabled people who also can make um, autonomous choices. And um, BPAS have had a report out pretty recently um, saying that coercion of doctors was mentioned, uh, or coercion by doctors, um, saying that uh, disabled women and uh, women of colour were more likely to report that they're being coerced to um, take long acting reversible contraception, so things like IUDs. Um, so there definitely is, there are attitudes about disabled people that, that need to be challenged. And it's not just, um, yeah, it's, it's not a zero sum game. Um, we need to provide reproductive health care for everybody that's appropriate to their needs. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, um, but hopefully that was helpful. You did. Thanks very much, Daniel. Thank you, ladies. Okay, thank you, Paula. I'm going then to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan, please. Thank you, and thank you, Alison, Helen, and Danielle, for for your presentations this morning. I suppose, uh, firstly, Danielle, and one of your finishing comments there, you talked about uh, people that have been played uh, with disabilities, and they're they're playing on people that are vulnerable as to the the contents of this bill. And I suppose I would say, just in for, first and foremost, like, I don't believe that for one instance in relation to this bill. I believe it is actually giving a voice to people. Whom with disabilities who have asked us to speak up on their behalf, uh, who they feel have actually have been denied and excluded from the conversation. So I'll just put that as a prelude. Um, you, Danielle, your approach and, and that of uh, the Women's Policy Group and your presentation is very much focused on the perspective of mothers who want to end their pregnancies. So could I ask you what you would say to someone with Down syndrome or another non-fatal disability who says that having a law that says unborn babies with disabilities like theirs can be aborted uh, up to birth precisely because of their disability makes them feel that they should not exist? Well, I think you've already heard from Alison that that's not the case. Um, Down syndrome isn't a permitted reason for an abortion after 24 weeks. Um, I'd also draw attention to groups like Disabled Women in Ireland, who advocate for um, a pro-choice position, and Sisters of Frida, who also are a pro-choice organisation, um, who advocate for the rights of disabled women on many issues, 
including abortion access. Um, I don't think, I don't see where this imaginary um, question that you pose is going to happen. Um, but I have had said to me, um, what if your mother had aborted you? Um, well, that would have been her choice. Um, it's not for me to to criticise any other person's decision that they've made um, on an informed way um, with the, the input of their partner and their medical practitioner as appropriate. Um, it's, not, it's not for me to criticise somebody else's choice. Um, I think everybody should be able to make an informed choice at the minute. Women in Northern Ireland aren't offered the same screening as people elsewhere are offered. Um, so quite often the informed choice isn't actually um, fully facilitated. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed as well. Um, but, um, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm listening obviously to the to the views of, of many of those people with disabilities who presented to the committee in support of this bill who feel that this does discriminate them against them uh, and I listened even to the language and maybe Alison could clarify the specific case uh, of the particulars around the example that you gave about uh, an abortion in relation to Down syndrome where you use language like um, parents had hoped that their child might be well, uh, parents had hoped that their child might look after their other children. Uh, they talked about the terrible burden of their other children and how that impacted upon their choice about about their unborn child at that time, and how that how that relates into the very comments which I mentioned earlier from people like Tommy Jessops, an actor with the BBC crime drama Line of Duty, where he said we are the only group of people in the United Kingdom where people try to end our lives before we are born just because we have Down syndrome. So I suppose it's just, it's the language that has been used, and and in in reality. Uh, what has happened across England and Wales where we have seen uh, those people uh, with Down syndrome which seems to be targeted because of their disabilities? Um, Jonathan, first of all, after 24 weeks, Down syndrome on its own without another very severe fatal related abnormality is not possible. So it's not before 24 weeks, then yes, it is possible. The case that I alluded to were a couple, I would, if you had met that couple, if you had understood what they were going through, if you had phoned and listened to the constant wailing that that poor woman and her husband who'd had to give up their jobs, who'd lost their income, who were under huge um, economic stresses, yes, they did want a child who as well, who could go out and live independently and get a job live a normal life if, if there's such a term as normal that they could go out and get somebody to support and look after their other two children when they died with all due respect um somebody with down syndrome would not be able to probably provide or independently look after those other children now again i think there is i mean and we're all we're all very we're all very capable of doing this of saying that you know, people with Down syndrome, and that is their right. Absolutely, I agree. It is their right to say, why are we being picked on? Are they being picked on more than other other disabilities? I don't think so. Um, you know, and there are people. I have uh, I have friends who have children with Down syndrome. One of them didn't know, wasn't given the option termination. One was said she would never have gone for it, but she knows what I do, and she is pro-choice because she says for her to look after her child. Um, it, it takes. It is. It is a dramatic change in life, and it needs a special type of person. And she says her heart breaks for a thought of somebody being forced to carry on a pregnancy for a child with a disability like hers, that um, feels that they couldn't cope with that child. Um, so you know, every case is individual. You're obviously. Um, I get the impression you're. You know, you're not supportive of abortion for women. I wasn't until I went into Obson Gynae, until I actually saw the kind of things that people go through in this life, the kind of problems that I have listened to in that little pink room. People have all kinds of problems. You've got them, I've got them that we don't know about. And to have a child with a severe or fatal abnormality is going to be the final straw. And we know from times in the past when people were not given the option of abortion, relationships broke down. People had severe mental health issues for the rest of their life. Children were not adopted into happy families. They went, they were rejected and they were put and they lived in institutions. So 
you know, this is something, it is a woman's choice. That is what we're asking for. We're asking for women's choice. We're asking for compassion. There are many, many people in this life that do amazing jobs um, or wonderful parents and look after people that are that have severe disabilities or who are going to have life limiting conditions. There are other people that for many reasons cannot um, do that and they should be given the opportunity that is being that is trying to be denied by this bill um, and stopping them from ending a pregnancy where they feel they cannot look after their child. Okay, I suppose and I'll just finish on this chair because I know you are pushed for time, but I would have to respectfully disagree with, with Alison and and you know I do fundament I can only go by the the story that you told in the first instance and, and the language that you used uh, but I, I happen to disagree and I believe that that people should be given a chance in life and I know in relation to those families that have been in contact with me about this bill that are supportive of it who have children with Down syndrome that feel that it is discriminatory towards them and, and that is something in which uh, I believe uh, is, is, is true in relation to the current laws and something that I'm supportive of. But I, I thank you for taking the time to, to present to the committee today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. And going then to Carol Nikillen. Go ahead, Carol, please. Well, thank you all for your presentation today and thank you all for your perseverance. Um, so the question I wanted to ask was in relation to, um, I mean, also your party, in fact, you have clarified it. You all have that after 24 weeks um, with a, a diagnosis of an uncomplicated pregnancy of someone with Down syndrome just doesn't allow it. So, I mean, that for me, we need to deal in facts. Um, but I just want your views on this Staunton clinic to healthcare about, because for me that is coercion and control. Um, I just want your views on that. And finally, just to say that, um, that I respect everything that is have all done for families, particularly women, um, notwithstanding your own personal experiences. Um, I also feel that um, what hasn't been extracted from part of this is the other example of health and social care workers now, albeit this was in the past, were women who, who did want to end a pregnancy just because it just couldn't continue. Um, we're not given support at all. In fact, they were told that not only was it illegal, it was immoral. So that in itself has changed slightly. So if you could just give me your views on this, the 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 control, uh, the coercion and control that would appear um, to happen at this healthcare clinic. Um, and again, I just want to put on the record my appreciation and thanks for coming here today and for your ongoing work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, panel, who, who will lead on that? Um, well, I... Um, yes, I have heard of um, some stories of women going to Stanton. I think the thing that um, in Doctors for Choice that we find, and um, I'm also a member of the NIAC group, I think the thing we find is that women are being brought there under false pretenses. Um, are you looking for an abortion? It looks like it's, it's offering women abortion, but then when they get there, it seems to be something quite opposite to that. Um, and I think now there's also the, the, although I don't know a lot about this area, there is the, the discussion that's being um, had about reversal of abortion, pills being given out. So I think I think when you're doing something, I think if you're doing something that um, you're taking people in on a false pretext, then that is something that is really wrong. And I must say we are surprised that uh, this clinic still seems to be operating. But again, I don't know the legalities of... Um, of what that entails but I think that's very wrong for women for some women they will go there and I mean women should be given a balanced opinion you know they should know that they can carry on with pregnancy or that you know they could have an abortion um, however I think if they go in and they're given a very very one-sided um, 
view, then that is wrong. As I've said, from a medical point of view, if we were accused of doing that, we would have to be investigated. We would have to be, um, and we would face being struck off, for example, from the GMC as a doctor, if you were found to be uh, really coercing or forcing somebody's hand, um, that, that, that should not be done. But I, I'm not sure how this clinic gets away with that if it seems to be doing the opposite, because that is what we are hearing. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. And Danielle has indicated their raised hand. Go ahead, Danielle, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would uh, say that there are options for non-directive counselling. Informant Choices Northern Ireland will give everybody um, all their options. Um, however, because services haven't been commissioned, they are a charity and they're at risk. They're on my edge of whether they can continue and have announced that in October they'll have to withdraw the central access point for booking um, because of a lack of commissioning and a lack of funding. Um, so there are options there. This isn't, it isn't a prescription. It's not you've received a diagnosis, therefore you must have an abortion. It's, it's an option. And we need to work towards a society where people are supported whether they choose to continue with that pregnancy or not. So that includes having accessible childcare for disabled children, which we currently have a, a great lack of, and um, the Employers for Child Care Survey as will illustrate that. Um, we need, um, you know, the PIP payments, the report that was out today, which I know was mentioned in the previous, um, in the previous um, briefing. Um, we've, we've got very, very low levels of support for, for disabled people. Um, so we need to ensure people are supported, whichever. Um, whichever path they choose. Um, in terms of Stampton and the um, abortion reversal pill, I just draw the committee's attention to the series of reports about open democracy. We have um, revealed what was said within um, so-called crisis pregnancy centres, and also um, they did some undercover um, investigative journalism, which resulted in action being taken against some doctors who were providing this. Um, abortion reversal pill, which isn't medically sound. Um, and also, going back a bit, um, just to, to reply to Jonathan Buckley, that um, the points being made about um, your hearing from disabled people who disagree with this law. Disabled people aren't a homogenous group. There's disabled people who support this law too. There's disabled people, disabled women who are members of women's policy groups who support this law. So um, there's, there's as many different views amongst the people who are disabled as there are in the population as a whole. Um, okay. With Stampton, Thanks. if you Google abortion okay. Belfast, Stampton will come up. This is because there is no information from the Department of Health on how to access an abortion. If people are lucky enough to find Informant Choices Northern Ireland, they'll get all the information. If they're lucky enough to find the Alliance for Choice website, they'll get all the information. But if you Google abortion Belfast, the search engine optimization that they've done, um, Stanton Healthcare is where you're going to get directed to, rather than, than NHS provided care, which is just wrong. Thank you, Danielle. And I see Helen has a hand up as well. Helen, briefly, if it's on this answer, please. Well. Yeah, I, I would just say briefly that sort of these these clinics, some of them operate um, in the Republic of Ireland as well, and they will quite often target people who are already vulnerable. So they'll either target people. Uh, you know, they'll target migrant groups, they'll target people with who are already socially and economically vulnerable, because uh, quite often the goal is not to provide any counseling or help, but just to delay them past the point where they cannot legally access abortion. We've seen that happen quite frequently here. Um, I, yeah, I, it, and I think it emphasizes the need for evidence-based information to be given and available for people at all stages throughout pregnancy, whether they receive a prenatal diagnosis or not, so that they can make that informed choice that is best for them in their circumstances. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Carol. And going the final indication I have at this point in time now is from Gordon Lyons. Go ahead, Gordon, please. Thanks very much. And um, uh, Alison in particular, can I thank you and your team for the work that they have, that you have been carrying out in, in terms of supporting um, uh, families that have received um, very difficult diagnoses because I have some personal experience of that the, the, and the shock and the, the, the trauma that that can be um, for uh, for families when, when they're expecting so much uncertainty uh, as well. And um, I, I know you have um, some fantastic uh, staff 
uh, right throughout the health service. And I do want to very publicly thank them for the support that they they have given. Um, uh, I had a couple of questions. The, the first was around the current regulations, um, uh, which state that abortions can take place at any time if um, there is a physical or mental um, impairment as to be seriously disabled, which is um, down to two registered medical professionals to, to, to assess that. To a degree, that's obviously subjective um, based on what they consider to be seriously disabled. We've heard very clearly from you this morning that you don't believe that Down syndrome on its own um, is, is, is a reason um, for termination. Have you found um, or are doctors finding it difficult um, to come to an agreement on what that actually means? Is there Can there, can there be wide variations on that? Um, and then the second question I was going to ask was along similar lines to, um, uh, to Jonathan um, about um, the message that this is sending to disabled people um, because I know I've got so much correspondence and I accept what Danielle says, not a homogenous group by any means, but so much of the correspondence that I have received from people who, who say to me, um, essentially what the law as it stands is doing at the minute is saying there's a difference between disabled people and people who are not disabled in terms of their value. But Mr. Chairman, I, I'm aware that question has already been asked. I'm, I'm assuming that um, others don't want to add too much to that. So in the interest of time, I'm happy to let that go. But perhaps um, from Alison, just a little bit of, of, of feedback in terms of how that judgment takes place as to what a serious disability is. And then do you take other considerations outside of the child's own disability uh, into consideration such as family circumstances on that basis? Is that what you were trying to say in terms of the, the other two children of the example that you gave? Thank well, you. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. The, um, the first case I gave up didn't apply because it was less than 21 weeks. And I think if you if you really look at it, you know, under 21 weeks, um, you know, you can have abortion um, under 21 weeks for a range of, uh, well, in Northern Ireland, it would always be for a, a severe disability. After 24 weeks, there is, there is strict guidance about what we, as an FME, you know, we have to go through all the, the um, so for example, you could have a child that's got what appears to be a genetic abnormality. There could also be structural abnormalities and scans, serious cardiac um, brain abnormality, for example. Um, what we would then discuss is go through um, what kind of life that child expects. Would it would it die in utero? Would it die shortly after birth? If it lived, how long would it live? Would it would its life be very very restricted? Um, so I think we're talking about severe life limiting disabilities, where um, if a, a child is born, it is going to um, it is going to die uh, very shortly or not very shortly, but it's going to die. It's not going to live probably into healthy adulthood. So, for example, a child with Down syndrome with no other abnormality can live into a healthy adulthood. But a child that is born with severe, severe cardiac, um, unfixable cardiac or brain abnormality may have um, a very limited quality of life. For example, it may never be able to even have eye contact with its parents, be in a wheelchair and will, will die um, in infancy or before the age of five. So we're talking really, really serious um, conditions. So each case is dealt with very individually. Um, and so far in Northern Ireland, we haven't had many um, that have gone over the 24 weeks. But so far, they have been things there's, where really we're talking, um, there is very, very poor quality of life. Um, so I don't know whether I can help you much more because, again, each each case is individual. And I understand what you're saying. Um, and I think it's, it's only right people that from disabled groups, they have the right to say they feel that they're being discriminated or picked on. But however, what we're talking about, um, as Danielle said, is a woman's choice, that it is a woman herself that must make that choice about that uh, her pregnancy. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, uh, Gordon. Yeah, back to you, Gordon. Sorry, I, I, I dropped out there for um, a, a little second due to connection problems. I got most of, of the answer there. Um, uh, I, like, I understand um, what you have said in relation to life limiting disabilities. Uh, I suppose what the um, regulations actually say is, is it's seriously disabled is, is still a reason. And um, I think that fundamentally what we're doing with the regulations that we currently have um, is treating children differently 
um, based on whether they're disabled or not. And, and that that's the real challenge with the current regulations. And that's what I believe that the um, bill is trying to do uh, here um, is to uh, rectify that. Um, but um, look, I think I think a lot of us will be um, taking different views on this here. But I do appreciate your your time uh, and the answers that you've given. Okay, thank you, Gordon. And um, I just want to thank each and every one of the panel for attending here this morning and giving the committee your evidence and engaging with committee members on the question and answer session and also for the written evidence you provided. So Dr. Hunter, uh, Helen and Danielle, thank you very much and I wish you all the very best in the time ahead and please take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Thank, okay. thank you. Okay, members. Okay, members, so I propose now we'll take a very short break there and resume at 12.15. So if members could just take a very quick break and we'll resume at 12.15. Thank you. And, Clerk, can you uh, advise when, when that is? That's Grand Con. We'll take you out of the, the spotlight there and that's us um, not broke. when we can resume. Grandcom, we're just bringing members up into the spotlight now, so once we have the members up, we're ready to, to go. Okay. That's us whenever you're, you're ready, Chair. Okay, thank you, members. So we now resume our committee meeting in open session again. Um, and uh, item seven then is SR2021 20, forward slash 160. Public Health Notifiable Diseases Order 2021. I refer members to papers at tab 7 and in particular to the clerk's memo on this issue at tab 7.1. This SR makes hepatitis C a notifiable disease so that medical practitioners will be required to share patient information with the PHA if they become aware or have reasonable grounds for suspecting that a person they are attending has hepatitis C. I would remind members that we considered this uh, SL1 policy proposal for this SR at our meeting on the 15th of April and requested further information from the department at that time. The department's response is included today again at tab 7.5 of the pack for information. The committee did consider the response at our meeting of the 6th of May and agreed that we were content that the department make the statutory rule. The examiner for statutory rules has no comments to make on this SR and the SR is subject to the negative resolution procedure. So do members have any further issues they wish to raise in relation to this SR? Chair? No. Yeah, go ahead, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, just reading through the pack and uh, there's obviously questions raised um, around um, confidentiality um, around so maybe moving it to notifiable disease. So. Unless I missed it in the pack, was there any uh, answers by the department given to um, concerns raised to the, the consultation process in, in regard to uh, those concerns? Um, I will check with the clerk. Um, I, I presume this this is very much in keeping with, with a, lot, a range of other notifiable diseases, so I'm not sure if there's any particular additional um, confidentiality issues or protections indeed, but I'll check with the clerk. Clerk, are you aware of? What the detail is on that? Uh, sure. In relation to the issues that were raised last time, there there was um, an issue raised in relation to uh, the delay in bringing forward this because I think it had been sitting for considerable time since I think it might have been two thousand and four, two thousand and six. Um, that um, other other jurisdictions had taken this like uh, this action. We also requested further information on the consultation that the department took forward. On it, and they provided um, a list of all those that they consulted on. There, there wasn't any issue raised in relation to the confidentiality um, of information. I presume this falls in with the other um, notifiable diseases that are that are listed. Uh, there's quite a long list of notifiable diseases, so I presume the same protections that are in place for those around confidentiality would be the same for for the hepatitis C. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, that, that would kind of be my understanding too. And I think this was really plugging what was a, a, lo- a long delayed a long delayed gap. And I think that was really the committee's key concern around that back at that time. But are you satisfied with that, Jerry? That it's it's in keeping with all the other notifiable diseases that are Yeah, sure. I mean I have no issue to challenge that, but it just uh, my, my recollection from reading the papers was there was uh, is that there was concerns raised about, you know, confidentiality, but um, if members are, are content with that, then uh, I would obviously take my lead for, from others on that. Okay, any other comments or, or concerns, members? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't think so. Can we note that concern, Clark, and just just reiterate the concern that that the committee wish to ensure that everything is done to ensure confidentiality? Um, can we do that as, as well as as formally ratify it? We, we we certainly can put a put a note of that in the in the minutes and feed that back into the department. Okay. Thanks. Good time with that, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if there are no other issues to raise, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR twenty twenty one forward slash one six zero public health notifiable diseases order NA twenty twenty one and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Okay, members, so we are moving on then to some items of correspondence, and I'll draw your attention to a few items, first of all in the main pack, and then I'll deal with any correspondence in the table pack. So item 8.2 is a departmental response to issues raised during the briefing on the inquiry into hyponatremia-related deaths. Do members have any comments, or are members content to note that correspondence? Content to note, I think, members. Thank you. 8.3 is a departmental response to the committee's request for an update on the urology public inquiry. Um, Jonathan, do you have a... Yeah. Yes, no, sure, sure I do. And, and this is something that has continually concerned me. But I note, I, th- I think from what I'm reading, it seems to be a bit of a backtrack from the minister because we, we were promised uh, and as, when he originally came to the committee that he would consult with the committee in relation to the terms of reference. But the latter seems to indicate that we will just be notified of the terms of reference. And I think it's important that we get a bit of clarity on that. Uh, I, I do remember the minister's specific comments because they did put me at ease in relation to ensuring that the terms of reference uh, took in all aspects of this particular case. So, so that has caused me some concern and I would like clarity on it. So are members content that we seek further clarity on that issue? Yep, members are content, yep. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Moving on then to item 8.5 is a departmental response to concerns raised by the committee regarding protested health facilities offering abortion services. Also at tabs 8.15 and 8. are responses from the Southeastern Trust and the Southern Trust on the same issue. The committee wrote to... We wrote at that point to the Department of Health, the Department of Justice and the Trust to seek further information. So um, do members have any comments at this point or are members content to note pending responses from the others? And then we will we will deal with them um, in totality. Go ahead, Orlea. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So just on 8.5, um, there's two things. So I'm just conscious in... Um, one of the paragraphs in the minister's response, um, he has said that in light of AIDS and COVID-19 pressures, that um, his department has resumed work to develop a service specification for the commissioning of abortion services. And I was just wondering if um, the committee would be in agreement, if we could just seek some further detail and clarity on that line in the minister's response. So what, you know, just to define that a wee bit more, what does that mean if they've resumed work to develop um, the commissioning of services? And then the other thing was, my understanding was whenever I raised this at committee last week, we had agreed to write to the minister, and I know what my proposal was, was to write to the minister on three things that was coming up out of the briefing sessions. So the first thing was around the um, protests that were happening outside the clinics, and the ministers obviously referred to that in his response. But the other two issues that have come up was um, the lack of information, you know, around what abortion services were available. And I know that that issue has come up again today around 
um, you know, when even when women are searching on the internet and, and what the department is doing just around that to put out public information around what services are available and accurate information. And then the third thing was the issue around the abortion reversal pills and the department's positioning on that. Yeah, I'll go to Paula first and then I'll come back to your uh, request, Orlea. So Paula, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Orlea, for fully concur with the, the queries that you're raising there. Um, and it, it should go further than that. I, I, I was very, very touched on, on the information we got today. I thought it was very stark in terms of the potential that if, if this mess continues with the lack of a, a, a regulated framework here in Northern Ireland that potentially we will have women pushed from pillar to post and potentially going over to England um, without the proper support from uh, medical professionals here. So my question is more maybe to the clerk and, and that is, you know, to what degree are we aware that departmental officials are actually watching these evidence sessions um, and have access to the written um, submissions that we are receiving because there is really powerful front line information there that they really have to take on board as part of their, their deliberations around the commissioning services as outlined in the health minister's letter. So that I'd like a bit of clarity on that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. um, well, uh, so Clerk, I'll go to yourself there first and then I'll come back. Yeah, it, it, it's just to say in relation to the issues you, ra you raised earlier, um, we have a separate letter off to the department on those issues. They were That was issued last week as well. We just split up this issue from it because we were writing to the others um, as well. So the, the, there is a letter into the department on the other two issues that you, you raised. Um, in relation to the department's interaction on this bill, um, all the submissions are, are published um, on the committee's website. The department has access to that. Um, there are departmental officials that, that watch committee meetings, whether they're directly involved in um, this issue. I'd imagine the, 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 the data will direct um, things like that, the Hansards and the evidence that comes in to those officials. So um, I, I couldn't guarantee that officials are listening live, but they, they would certainly be informed of um, discussions. Um, they do have access to all the, the evidence that we've received, um, and they have access to all the, the, the Hansards once they're published as well. Um, Chair, thank you. Clerk, can I come back in, please, briefly? Um, I, I, I would support Orlea's um, request then that we ask for clarity around that, this piece of work. And then um, when we receive that, I think that it would be useful for us to then to bring those Department of Health officials to committee to give us um, an oral update as well. But uh, I think a written um, submission at this um, briefing at this stage would probably be most helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, are members content that we write to seek that clarification? And Orlea, are you content that the other letters ha are, have been issued separately? Yes, that's great. Thanks very much, Keith. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. Moving on then to item 8.9, which is correspondence from the, from the department advising that it intends to make a statutory rule to revoke the establishment and agency's fitness of workers regulations NA 2020. These regulations were made on the 2nd of April 2020 to give effect to a temporary COVID-19 pre-employment vetting policy that permitted employers to recruit staff quickly to health and social care posts on the basis of more limited pre-employment checks. So um, I have actually a, a bit of an issue here in relation to the, uh, the, the, the way this has been presented to us. It's not in the form of an SL1. Now, I, I recognise that the committee has been, um, I think, appropriately flexible with the department in terms of dealing with the emergency and the speed with which some of these regulations had to be brought in. And it jumps out to me the 2nd of April. I think we can all still very, very acutely remember the situation we were facing on the 2nd of April and the emergency legislation was that was being brought forward, M much, much of which we would never have considered in ordinary times but we were dealing with an unprecedented situation. We have also, across the course of the pandemic and more in recent times, raised with department officials as to when they will return to a more normal process of SL1 committee, being able to apply scrutiny, provide advice, uh, interact at that point in time with it. So I don't see the haste in terms of in terms of this having to be done 
on an emergency or a truncated basis, I have to say. So I think this will be a case in point where I would have thought that this would come as an SL1. We would engage with it on that basis, and then it will become an SR. So I had asked the clerk to clarify that with the department, what the reason for that was, or was there any reason? Um, I'm just going to check with the clerk, because I know as, as of when the meeting started, there hadn't been a response. So clerk, could you just could you just uh, clarify whether there has come anything in while no, the meeting's no, been on? No response yet. Okay, well, I, I, I actually think we should, we should I think, write back to the department and ask them to bring this forward as an SL1 as per the normal, as per the normal, uh, the normal procedure. What would members' views be of that? Members agree that we, yeah, that we seek that clarification. Or if there is a particular reason in relation to this particular case, uh, the, the department can outline that. But I think in general, we need to see where time allows, we need to go back to absolutely to the proper statutory processes that are in place to, to, to amend legislation. It's an important function and one that I don't think we as a committee do or should take lightly. So, okay, okay, that, that's fine. Members were agreed on that. Item 8.10 then is a response from the Western Trust uh, in relation to our request for further details regarding the workforce issues that have impacted on the Trust's reproductive health care services. Any comments on that item, members? Um, I have to say I, I thought that the response did, in fairness, uh, illuminate more of the difficulties and, and give more detail on the difficulties, but I still fail to see any real action plan or proposal from the department or the trust as to what they're doing about it. And I think actually we, we should write back and ask them to outline how they're proposing to address the problems that they're identifying. I think the problems are well enough identified. I think it's very regrettable that, that a failure of workforce planning would lead to the collapse of a service um, a, 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 and a service that's that's a... Uh, entitled women are people are and women are entitled to in law. So would members be content we write back again and ask them to outline what they're doing about the problems that they have identified? Yeah, members content. Sure, you. just just sure, just on that. Um, yeah. So long as the committee is not prescriptive as to what the solution is, uh, I, I don't mind writing for information, but I don't think it would be appropriate for us to to agree on what the potential solution is, which I know others from other comments previous have have indicated in past individual committee members may have a particular preference as to how that may be dealt with, but I would just want to echo that it wouldn't be a committee position without specifying what it would mean. Well, the committee the committee will be, if if they so choose, in a future date to be prescriptive. That that is the committee are entitled to be prescriptive should they so wish and should committee should the committee agree. At this point, however, I'm not suggesting I don't have the answers and I don't know if any committee members have the answers. What I'm asking is for that that that, that the committee agree that we ask the Western Trust to outline to outline their a uh, their their what they're doing about this situation rather than simply uh, reporting it to us. I think it's appropriate that we would ask them to also report to us what they're planning and proposing to do about that. Yeah. So are members content with that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, have members any comments or proposals on any of the other items of correspondence in the main pack? So are members therefore otherwise content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Yes, thank you, members. Okay, members, the table pack contains sorry, a number sorry, of further... Sorry, Go ahead, Paula. Go on. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's for possibly after summer recess, but I think it would be useful to um, engage with our QIA, the new chief executive. I think it's been a while since we've had them before us, and obviously the issue with Stanton today has come up around regulate, regulatory powers. So I think it would be useful if we could try to engage with the new chief executive as soon as possible. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I, I would have preferred that come up in AOB, but anyway, um, Carol, go ahead. Well, I can deal with it in AOB, um, Chair, because I've already indicated... If it's related, it's related go ahead now. Yeah, if it's related, go well, ahead now, Carol. Well, it's just, I mean, I, I'm unaware, so if it's this is already Karen Fonte Committee, I apologise. But have the committee ever received a report of the mass resignations of our QIA regarding the, some of the... Um, the COVID uh, responses or infections within um, some of the care homes. I, I'm, 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 I'm just asking that. I have another issue. No, I don't. Oh, so okay. So I, could, I don't think that has. I don't think that has arrived. Okay, so I, I'm asking under this that if we are getting uh, a new chief executive in before that, I would like to see the report if it's possible. I believe this committee should have that report. Yeah. So. 
request a report and, and if necessary, then we can include that as part of that briefing and engagement with RQAA that that, that, that issue would be raised. Are members content with that? Yep, thank you. Uh, content for that to be scheduled, okay. Um, so members then, are members then always content with the correspondence items on the main pack before I deal with table papers? Yep, thank you. Table papers then, there's a couple of further items of correspondence I'd like to draw your attention to. First of all, on the IHRD, Professor Young, at Tabia point two of the table pack, there's a response from the department in relation to the lane management of Professor Young. Carol, that was you, I think, had raised that issue. Do members have any comments in relation to that? Yeah, um, Chair, sorry, could I come in? Yeah. So, um, Chair, I'm not content with the response. Um, I believe that this is something, unless we get clarified and clarified completely, that if, for example, it is the Belfast Trust who have land management of Professor Ian Young, then the question is, the question for me is, how is that happening? How is a modern evaluation done? And what arrangements are there in relation to his appointment to the Department of Health? Because I, I'm not I'm not seeing that at all. Yeah, it's not very clear to me either, I have to say. So would members be content that we seek further clarity on how that how that uh, line management functions given this accountant situation? Yeah, members content. Uh, in terms of neurology services, then members at tab 8.21, there's a response from the department providing further information relating to the independent neurology inquiry terms of reference, the cohort three recall and the neurology services review. Now, I'm content, I, I'm, I'm conscious that that's quite a lengthy response. There's a lot of complexity within that issue in neurology. If members were content, I would propose that we put that maybe back into next week's pack and give members a chance to further uh, reflect on it before we come back to, to see what, what we may wish to do next in relation to that item. It's just uh, there's so many strands to it. I think it, it bears some further sure. consideration. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would Sorry, agree with Carol, I'll take, I'll take. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And Paula? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Carol. I'll, I'll come in after. Thanks. thanks. No, Chair. Thanks, Paula. No, I appreciate that. I, I think this is too substantial an item. Uh, and I do think we need careful scrutiny of it, um, particularly given the fact that, you know, this uh, independent inquiry is independent of the department. We don't know much about it. There are certainly frameworks and other issues as part of the uh, O'Hara report and others that are out for consultation, particularly about, you know, openness and transparency in a duty of candor. And now the third cohort are coming through, for me, to be frank, I think this is a classic departmental response in terms of saying everything and nothing. So I would contend, I would ask that we do consider it next week. And I, depending on what we consider and what we go forward to have in our heads to bring the officials back again, because I, I, I'm just, I think this is all fluff and no stuff, to be frank. Okay, any other comments, members? Are members generally content that we re-table that? Go ahead, Paula. Sorry, Colin, thank you for um, letting me back in. Um, I, I was just going to ask if the clerk could send us that actual uh, piece of correspondence via email. It's just I, I suppose a lot of us have been engaging with um, people who've been affected by um, Dr. Watt and this whole inquiry, and I've just, uh, sorry, the investigation recall. I'd just like to be able to engage with them around it and sort of get some feedback from the people who are actually affected. So, um, but I very much concur with what Carol has said there, that we this is something I think we need to get back on the agenda, not just under correspondence, but a, a key item at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So members, I think, are otherwise content. I don't see any other indications. So, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, and the clerk has indicated, yes, that he will, he will forward that as you requested. Paula. Moving on to tab uh, tab 8.22 is on cataract waiting times and there's a response there from the department to issues raised by an individual in relation to waiting times for cataract surgery. The response advises that the current waiting list for routine surgery is two years and for urgent cataract it is two months. The response advises that the Down Hospital is going to pilot a one-stop see and treat cataract service from early July. Um, I think I think given the difference in what that person is reporting and what um, 
what the what the actual experience is and what we've been told by the department. I I think myself, I, I may engage with that person just to, to get more clarity or seek more clarity or even to forward on the department's response directly to that individual because I think it is a worrying kind of a, a, a an outlier. If it if it is an outlier, that's worrying, but if it's more fundamental, that's even more worrying again. The response also advises that the Down Hospital is going to pilot a one-stop see and treat cataract service from early July. So I'm wondering the members have any comments in relation to that or any of the other response on that on that item. I, I think I have to say personally I would welcome that. That sounds like something that would be um that that could deal with a portion of the waiting list issue, that, that there would be that sort of an urgency of approach. It may also have to deal with some of the do not attends and things where people are coming and getting treated and getting. So I think that's something to be welcomed, I have to say. So uh, are members content that we, that we forward the response to the individual who raised the issue, the response we've now received? Yeah, members are content, thank you. A tab at point two four then is a correspondence from an individual in relation to restrictions on visiting in hospitals, would members be content that we forward that to the department for a comment from them in relation to that issue? It's an issue we picked up on before, members. So, yeah, members content. Thank you. And do members have comments in, in relation to any of the other table papers? No. Okay. Thank you, members. Okay, then moving quickly on to the forward work program, I refer you to tab 11.1 .1 of your pack. Are members content to note the forward work program? Yeah. Thank you, members. And before we go into our closed session, then, do members have any other business today? Paula, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm increasingly concerned that we have not had the um, Adoption and Children's Bill, nor the Organ and Human um, Tissue Donation Bill in front of us here at committee. These are really important pieces of legislation that we as a health committee should be scrutinising and supporting the department to take forward during this mandate. So I would like, um, I know that the health minister is very keen himself to have us work with his departmental officials on, on these two bills. And so I would like to get a bit of clarity from the department as to where they are at this point in time. We're a week or so away from summer recess. And if they don't come before us soon, then they have little chance of getting forward. And that's not fair to Dahi and his family and other campaigners who work so diligently in, in these two very important areas. Thank you. Okay, yeah, and and I think I would I would certainly would agree with you on that, and I, I do reflect on the fact that the the at the start of the the very start of this mandate when the assembly was was reconvened, myself and the previous deputy chair Pam Cameron met with the donate for Dahi campaign and met with Little Dahi himself, uh, a, a lovely meeting I have to say, but very worrying issues, and we have indicated throughout to the minister that we'd be very keen to support and to do all we can, and we will. We will take whatever steps it takes to get this through, but we can't do anything unless it's put before us. So I do think that's an issue of concern. So I see some members indicating. I'll check in if it's on this issue or on other issues. I'll go first of all to Jerry Carroll. Uh, I, I want to support Paul on that, but it's a separate issue, Chair. Okay. And Alan, or Alan, are you in on this issue before we clarify and close on this issue? Or have you a different issue? I'll go there and check. I'll just check with the chair. Chair, same issues as Paul. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, Alan. Uh, yeah I, I agree. I think it's absolutely shameful that, uh, that these two very, very important uh, bills that are going to impact very positively on, on a lot of people's lives uh, have seen to have hit some sort of a logjam uh, within the executive. Uh, and uh, I, I would maybe go a little bit further than Paul and request uh, from the department that uh, obviously on a confidential basis uh, that uh, I'd like to see a timeline of, of just what discussions uh, the executive have actually had to date on either of these two bills and also uh, a timeline of what attempts uh, have been made to place these bills on the executive agenda. I think it's very important that we know that but there does seem to be some sort of a logjam, and I think we need to get to the bottom of it and uh, clear that logjam. Okay, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that once I've checked with Cara Hunter. Cara, are you looking to make a comment on this issue or a separate item of AOB? It's a separate item, but just, just to voice my agreement and support for what Alan and Paul are saying also. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, members, so we have a proposal there that we, we write to the executive office around the bills and also to the department asking for an outline on the engagement that there have been on the bills. Are members content with both those suggestions? Content. Yeah, members are content. Thank you. So I'll go back firstly to Jerry, and then I'll come to you, Cara. Jerry, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, Chair, I, I'm quite concerned. The story that, that broke yesterday around the executive uh, apparently uh, ignoring or, or going against, however you want to describe it, medical advice uh, given around the need to uh, isolate for, for people traveling within the CTA. So uh, I have a lot of questions around this, but I, I want to propose that we uh, contact the department of health and ask uh, for a copy uh, or certainly a uh, summary of the advice that was presented. And also, I think we need the right to, I presume, the executive office uh, to uh, explain and outline the rationale uh, for um, either supporting um, going against the medical advice or um, voting against it or, or whatever happened. I'm at odds to understand what happened. There's been little explanation of it. Uh, and this could be potentially, uh, I emphasize potentially, this could be one of the main reasons why uh, there will be um, another surge, another possible lockdown. So I think in the interest of transparency, we as a committee have a right and a duty to find out uh, why this decision was made. People can agree or disagree, but at the very least, we need to find out why uh, it was made and have an explanation of it uh, for, for our purposes and also the, the public as well. We want to propose those two things. Okay, and I would have no issue with with either of them as well, but I just will point out for information that we will have the minister here in two weeks' time as well, so there will be an opportunity to raise that directly, but I don't think that rules out the, the proposal at all uh, to write, write to both. Are members content that we do that? Yeah, okay, thank you. And um, Chiara, going to uh, your item of AOB, Chiara, please. Thank you, Claire. Um, no, it would just be around raising the issue of COVID passports. Um, I know I've had a number of constituents as we approach the kind of summer months, uh, very curious about what the next steps are, what considerations, um, you know, both the health department and the executive office, um, what conversations they've had around this, um, and just looking a bit of clarity from, from both uh, on what, what lies ahead and what people can expect if they want to travel this summer. If there's something we could do around that, yeah, and, and, and yeah, thank you, Karen. And I am aware that the, the the minister has indicated that he was looking at or working on a system of some kind of COVID certification. Um, I think there are there are huge issues around all of that that we do need to discuss certainly in due course. But I I would agree, and I think uh, would members agree that we write to the department asking for uh, a, an update, a, a very timely update in relation to where that work is at and what the projected timelines are for any system to be in place. Would that be, uh, members agree with that? Yep. Yep, members agree with that, Chiara. So, okay, on that one. Okay, members, so moving on then to Sorry, the time and place uh, before we go into our... Uh, yeah, go ahead, who, who's uh, indicating uh, there? Yeah, yeah, if I've gone up for AOB. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. So, um... So I want to go back uh, because when we're writing to the minister to ask about the executive, it's not just about the two bills that were mentioned. I would like to ask what other bills that or pieces of legislation or policy that the minister has for health has brought forward that's con that the minute hasn't received clearance. So that was my first part. Second part of the AOB is that um, in relation to the RQIA, um, I met with uh, formally with families of Muckamore yesterday, and I think an informal meeting with the health committee would be really timely, because some of the issues issues that those families have raised are quite shocking, actually about communication, about supports, and notwithstanding what they've had to go through and what they're still going through, they were very careful not to talk about ongoing police investigations. So it's just to allay that to um, colleagues, but I do think it would be really timely if we could meet them um, informally, particularly before we meet the new Chief Executive of the RQIA and the Minister for that matter. Thank you. And would you be willing to, could you facilitate and arrange, just in terms of arranging yes, that, Carol, as good. we have done previously, and then member, yeah, members will be I'm invited? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, it may also be it may also be useful in terms of of uh, getting an update from the minister when he's looking at the legislation because I'm very conscious around the safe staffing legislation, but I think it would still be useful to get an update on where various other pieces of legislation are, some of which I I would have liked to have seen in this mandate, but but have been indicated won't be. Um, but I think if we ask for along with what what the situation is with the two specific bills. What other bills have been caught up in in that similar way, and also the department's other legislative plans? I think will be useful just to get an update yeah. as we move into the next into the next day. Mr. Chairman, if I could come in on that, I I, I think that uh, yeah, I don't disagree with Carl uh, in terms of of requesting that additional information, um, but I, I think that it's distracting a little bit about the two most important pieces of information or uh, bills that are going through that Paula mentioned and that. And that I have uh, mentioned as well. Uh, that those are the two immediate uh, ones, and to me, very, very important. And I would like to hear the answers and see the timelines on those two. I think that uh, it should go in as a separate piece of correspondence from the committee. I think then uh, Carl suggests then that we follow up uh, with with other pieces. That should be another piece of correspondence. But I don't think that we should tie it into those two very, very important bills that seem to be have hit uh, an absolute logjam. Uh, so I, I would suggest that the two, it's two pieces of correspondence we need, uh, not not putting it all into one because I think you just completely dilute uh, the the importance of of the two that have, have been mentioned, the adoption bill and the organ bill. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't see where the problem is. I mean, I think asking for these two, where, where are these two very important pieces of legislation's grand and, uh, and if possible, could the minister not only outline what his legislative programme is, but what other papers that are things he has within the executive are waiting on clearance? Because these could be two of them, for all we know, unless you know well, but I don't. So well, well, Carl, what's your, what, Carl, what's your problem with two pieces of correspondence getting in rather than one? What's your what's your issue around that? I, I don't see where you're coming from. See, for me, it's just putting everything on one letter. I, I, I don't know if there's problems, Alan. You obviously oh, do. So the problem is that we have to write two, uh, one letter or two letters instead of one. I, I don't see that as a big problem, Carl. Um, I, I think the other hey, through through the chair, Alan. Alan, can you can you direct your remarks through the chair? Both of you, please direct your remarks through the chair. I apologise, chair. Uh, through the chair, yes, I think we've agreed that we would send one piece of correspondence in, and then Carl has come along then with this added piece. Uh, and as I said, I just I don't see any problem in writing two letters. I'm sure Keith's well up to writing two letters. Well, could I suggest as a compromise that that we that we we write the the correspondence, we write the correspondence, but we indicate to the minister that we we're seeking an urgent answer on the two specific ones, and mm -hmm. if he requires additional time, then not to delay on his response, but he can he can split the response into two into two I, responses. I would be content, sure. I would be content with that. That the other two are treated as a matter of urgency, as I want the answers, and I'm sure others do on those two specific pieces as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. Um, and I think that is everything then in AOB. <laughs> I, I think we've, we've, we've had a very substantive AOB today, but thank you for that, members. Um, so, members, I'm just going to announce date, time and place of next meeting, and then we're going immediately into closed session. So just, just in case uh, there's any misunderstanding around that. And, and we may be returning to open session at, at any time, depending on how the next two sessions go. So the date, time and place of the next formal meeting will be on Thursday, 24th of June at 9.30 a.m. via video link. Our members content. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, members. Okay, members. So um, we're now moving.